What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Fantasy Files podcast, the podcast that wastes hours of your life that you will never get back. I'm your host, Spencer, and no, we're not going to buy it at the store today because we have SFF addicts at home, kids. I'm joined (laughs) by the... I'm joined by Adrian Gibson, co-host of the SFF Addicts podcast and author of brand new debut novel, Mushroom Blues. Welcome, Adrian. Yeah, I got it right here. <laughs> got that, that blue baby, as I'm going to call it on the podcast. Nice. A little hardcover right there. But uh, thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. And yeah. uh, no, you don't have to get at the store. You got it live right now. <laughs> right in your ear holes. Enjoy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right in the ear holes. Uh, <laughs> we'll get into his book and his podcast in just a second. But remember that you can reach out to us if you'd like to over on Twitter and Discord. And if you'd like to not only support the show, but also get all of this content weeks before anybody else you can do so over on our patreon the first tier will get you access to exclusive content such as fantasy files after dark where gabe and i are basically sitting down like this and just hanging out and we play some games and getting answer sexy. questions and get sexy <laughs> that's right we absolutely do um and then and then the the second tier will get you access to all of these episodes that you're watching now on youtube you'll get them live as we record them you can actually participate in the show and and hang out with us so that's the second tier it's called the mistborn tier Uh, So check that out if that sounds interesting. Um, All of those links are in the description as well as the link to our 2024 bingo card as well as the instructions video for it. If you spell bingo using our episodes during 2024, we will straight up buy you a hardcover trilogy of your choosing. So don't miss out on that. Go to the description. It'll say bingo instructions. Just watch that video. It'll explain everything. Um, But yeah, we had a lot of fun designing that bingo card, and we hope you guys uh, take advantage of it. Uh, But housekeeping out of the way, let's introduce our guest once again, Adrian Gibson. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Yeah, man. It's an absolute (laughs) pleasure. Good job on the intros. You killed it. Oh, (laughs) thanks. Yeah, yeah, so as Spencer mentioned, uh, I'm Adrian M. Gibson. I am the creator and co-host of SFF Addicts Podcast, which I do with my bestie, fellow author, MJ Kuhn, uh, author of Among Thieves and Thick-Ass Thieves, as I like to (laughs) call it. Um, I'm also the author of Mushroom Blues, which is my debut novel. Got it here in paperback and hardcover. Uh, This is fungal punk noir it's a bit of a mix of (laughs) fantasy and sci-fi i like to pitch it as blade runner and true detective meld with the weird worlds of jeff vandermeer and china mieville so uh, maybe that's (laughs) up some of your alleys if you like fungi i am for sure so (laughs) (laughs) i've i've listened to a couple podcasts recently where you you were getting interviewed and yeah. you were talking about how into mushrooms you are. And I think that's so <laughs> that's so interesting. Um, and first of all, I love the cover of Mushroom Thank Blues. You, man. Yeah, that can, thing I, can is I just so show cool. this off? So shout out to yes. my cover artist, Felix Ortiz, um, who is just like an absolute rock star of the indie yeah. world. Many, many of the covers, the best covers that I've seen in indie fantasy and science fiction are from Felix. But <laughs> I'll just uh, do a close up. There's yeah, Koji, the mushroom-headed uh, beat cop, and there's Henrietta. She's a human detective. But I will take off the dust jacket and show off oh. the, naked, the naked hardcover, which is just gorgeous. Oh, that is sick, dude. And then so there's, like, the mushroom city with all the fungi incorporated into the architecture. We got that on the other side, too. Oh, that's cool. And then on the inside, I did all the, the graphic design and stuff like that. Uh, and the interior formatting so we got like pages like this oh i love that so lots of cool stuff there's also a map for anyone who's a big map nerd which i drew and designed myself so we got a big map. oh what two page spread so that's sick so is that like is that the city or is that the continent that's the city where the story takes place but over the course of this series and other adjacent fungal verse series which is sort of like my shared universe 
uh, it's going to explore different parts of this world. Nice. Hi, Spacey Nova. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Nova? Nova is my friend that I made while playing the video game in Shrouded. Uh, that's Ooh, cool. probably probably my favorite video game of the year so far. We've put uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how much time she's put into it, but I've put almost two hundred hours into Enshrouded. Holy, <laughs> dude! <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. So, yeah, <laughs> she's uh, she's been an awesome friend, and we just we play that game all the time. Um, really? So, what? Um, I, I'm curious because I think I've read. I don't know if I read the whole first chapter of Mushroom Blues, but I at least read part of it. And is it so? I I. I know that they're in this city where there's like this mushroom architecture and stuff, and it's it's uh, very different than what you would see in your average fantasy series. But outside that city, is everything else normal? Like, is everything else like normal Earth, or what? What's going so on outside? This is like a secondary world that's kind of like analogous to Earth in terms of um, sort of like biomes and stuff like that. Um, but there is one particular archipelago that was very heavily inspired by Japan that is kind of like separated by by vast swath of ocean and okay. that particular island uh, just has over the course of the development of this planet just has sort of fungi become this very prominent uh, sort of biological feature of its ecology okay. and so at some point, some humans ended up on this island, and over time, they symbiotically merged with fungi to become mushroom people. But in other parts of the world, there are regular humans who have different cultures, okay. different governments, and stuff like that. Um, and so it's just this one particular part of the, of the planet that is sort of rich in fungi, and that transferred to the people who inhabited that island. Okay, so is it the kind of thing, and I don't know, you can tell me if this is like a spoiler for later in the book or whatever, but is it, did, did like normal humans go there and they started eating the fungi and then having children over time, it just kind of became like a natural part of their like biology or? Yeah, I mean, it's like eating the fungi, um, just breathing the spores that are in uh, the air, all okay. this different kind of stuff. So it's kind of like the, 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 generational development of most species and the way they sort of adapt to certain environments okay. and in this case they just adapted to incorporate mushrooms into their own biology <laughs> to the point where there's like you know like yeah. mycelium sort of like like running along their brains there's like spores that are kind of incorporated into their biology and how they project their emotions and different things like that that's cool. Hey, can you imagine the first time that a baby was born with like a mushroom head? <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? Yeah, the parents are just like, well, what the fuck did we get into? Whoa. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'd hope by they're that like, point. Were they're either like, of us drinking during pregnancy? Yeah. Oh, my God. How many psychedelics were we taking when we had this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Have you seen the show? Um, Nova actually got me watching this show. Have you seen the show Sweet Tooth? No, on but Netflix. I've heard of it. Yeah, dude, it's it's actually really good. I uh, I had never really planned on watching it until it got recommended to me, and all of a sudden, um, I think it gets explained in the show. I don't know if I'm all the way through it yet, but uh, kids starting started getting born with. Um, different animal features so like one girl has like a pig snout and like pig ears and parts of her personality are like reminiscent of like a pig's and mm -hmm. then there's other other kids I think that like the main poster is like a kid with antlers or something with the like deer that. antlers yeah. yeah and and he's got a lot of personality quirks that are similar to deers like he's very um like shitting he, all over people's yards <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he just shits everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> just little pebbles of poo, just all over. <laughs> They're like, we had to keep it true to the animal, like yeah, you know. man. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> like, anytime, anytime he hears a sound, he's very like, very twitchy, mm -hmm. and you know that kind of stuff. And so I think it's interesting in that show. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I think it's interesting in that show where um, you'll see these kids with like different, just different aspects of an animal, and it's not like it's not like a kid's face on like an animal's body. It, it all mm-hmm. impacts them in very different ways. Like one may have human ears where another one has like deer ears. And it's, it's all, it's just kind of cool to see how the, uh, like the people doing the costumes and makeup, how they thought about how each of these specific, um, how like the genetics would impact certain kids right, in, right. in different ways. Like um, like the like the kid with like the pig snout would smell very differently than just like a regular human. Right. And just like yeah, like very very fundamental to like how would everything that we choose for these kids and their sort of like mutations affect how they perceive this world and perceive their environment. Exactly. Like some some can hear really well because yeah, they're yeah. like part you know whatever. Um, so is that I, I long story long is that kind of what you're playing with in mushroom blues like do people mm-hmm. have certain functions that a normal human wouldn't have by having this mushroom DNA yeah yeah definitely and so like they're able to kind of um, connect with each other emotionally so it's kind of like a, a tele- telepathy but more um, based in in sort of empathic uh okay. basis so it's like they they're able to emotions yeah they're stuff. able to pick up on each other's emotions i kind of treated it like the ways in which um mycelium interact beneath a forest and they're able to kind of like send out chemical signals that okay. tell other things in their environment or tell other uh fungal organisms or trees or whatever what they're sort of uh doing like what their intentions are where they're going if they want to transfer nutrients and stuff like that yeah um that's awesome and so they're able to kind of connect with each other in a sort of empathic telepathic way not necessarily like they can read each other's minds or each other's thoughts but Mm -hmm. they can read each other's uh emotions and intentions and vibes and things like that and people can also obscure that so it's like a social media network if you want to obscure your intentions and your emotions the other person knows that you're obscuring them but they don't know exactly what you're thinking and how you're feeling underneath yeah oh that's cool i like that idea a lot so what what else about mushroom blues do you want to talk about um i guess what was it like you know you you see some of these booktubers and and podcasters making or or writing books after doing you know after reading for so long and just Mm -hmm. being in the community for so long what was it like switching roles um from like the the reviewer side to then going and writing a book has that changed the way that you review things has it changed the way you interact with authors on your show or anything like that I mean, the entire time that I've been doing the podcast, I've actually been writing. So, oh, okay. yeah, so I kind of started the podcast selfishly as a way for me to like <laughs> just learn from other from from authors to be like, right. how can I how can I place myself in a position that is like as professional as possible mm. so yeah. I can talk to these people and not be like, hey, can I just have like an hour, an hour and a half right. of your time? Yeah. And they're like, for what? <laughs> You know what I mean? So it was it was a way for me to be able to to chat with authors and basically pick their brains about so many different aspects of writing. So it's like I went into the podcast specifically with the intention of like treating each episode. And it's like I have notebooks just like full of notes that I've taken over the course of my time doing the podcast. And wow, just like things that these authors have taught me, you know, from like episode one was like an intro to the show but like episode two had Hugh Howie on and just like learned so much Mm -hmm. about self-publishing and all this different kind of stuff right and up to like our last episode which was with like Veronica Roth who's the author of Divergent so it's like we've had like a huge breadth of authors from indie and New York Times bestsellers like Jim Butcher or Christopher Paolini but then we've also had like debut authors and and like smaller traditionally published authors so it's like every single person that comes on just absorbing as much of their amazing experiences as possible and then applying that to what I was doing as a a writer but obviously like for the first 
two years or so, I was always like an author in the making, you know, like an aspiring mm-hmm. author. But That's now, cool. and and like I could talk about certain things with a level of confidence, but now it's like, okay, cool. I can actually be like incorporating, <laughs> and same with MJ, like she, she yeah. incorporates her own experiences into the interviews and I'm able to do the same. And it's like, here's my book. And yeah. And, and it's like out in the world now and people can read it. And at the same time, like I can speak a little bit more confidently to authors about that. Cause like, man, that transition is so weird. Cause like the first time I got mm. interviewed as opposed to being the interviewer. Right. Was so, it wasn't, it wasn't like scary, but. Was there a I little bit like, of like imposter syndrome kind of yeah, going on? Yeah, it was like that, <laughs> a little bit of nerves, a little bit of like. I've had so much of this stuff bottled up in my head for so long and to finally be able to talk about it with other people. Uh, it was on like, uh, our pod on Wednesdays we read and, yeah. uh, and it's like, I know Hannah and and Laura, they're amazing. So I was like confident in, in the environment, but I was talking about these things where I'm like, Oh shit, man. Like I haven't actually spoken to anyone about this stuff. And then to (laughs) kind of have, have this opportunity to, to speak about it. And then I, I, caught myself a few times where I was like getting a little bit overly emotional and like kind of vomiting yeah. stuff out. And I'm like, okay, like tone it back a little bit. <laughs> Cause I, I don't know if you've experienced this. Like you see so many booktubers like, um, you know, like Philip Chase uh, or Daniel Green or so many different uh, booktubers who have crossed into the author space. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think some of them have maybe done it a little bit more successfully than others obviously a lot of the time it depends on their platform but there's also this kind of weird uh kind of distinction between like oh you're a book reviewer but you know i think this more from the community side like oh you're a book reviewer so like why do you feel like you are Mm -hmm. good enough to be an author etc etc or like oh you put your book out and it's like here are all these books that you've reviewed and you've criticized them for xyz and you do the same shit in your book. And this is like, it's such a right. weird transition that I feel like a lot of content yeah. creators go through. That that was kind of, um, I, I don't know if I've really felt this way with any other booktuber, but especially with uh, Daniel Green, when he came yep. out with his book, um, just as a viewer. And I, at the time, I don't even know, I don't even know if I had the podcast or if it was, or maybe we had just started the podcast when he came out with uh, the first two books. Mm-hmm. And I I kind of had the reaction of like, what does he know about writing? Just from, right, from, right. The, from like an audience perspective. Because it's, um, it's not a YouTube channel about writing in particular. Right. I feel like there are other booktubers like... Uh, Philip Chase. Like and Philip Chase or, like, uh, or, or even like um, Tim Hickson. Um, mm. Well, you know, you know what again. a weird one is, is uh, Brian Lee, Lee Durfee mm-hmm. and and his books. Um, I didn't even know that he had written those books. Th- those were books that I had just seen kind of floating around. And I was yeah. like, oh, those look cool. Maybe I'll check those out at some point. And I haven't really watched a whole lot of Brian Lee Durfee's stuff, but I've seen like a couple of his reviews and stuff. And it wasn't until way later that I learned that he was even the author of those. And mm-hmm. so that was kind of interesting because I'm like... Did he, did he write before doing the YouTube channel or did he publish after? I have no idea. Because that was the weird thing for me. I was like, I don't know. I, I don't know if he's a reviewer who became an author or an author who happens to Review like, stuff also be a reviewer. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know so. a lot of authors who are now like getting into... Yeah. Into like doing book reviews and stuff. Uh, Tim Hickson's channel is Hello Future Me. That's the oh, one I was yes. thinking about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he he does like tons of stuff on like world building and writing and and character arcs and all this. He talks a fuckload about Avatar: The Last Airbender, which I absolutely love that show. But okay. he, you know he he kind of like his channel was built on a lot of uh, sort of craft stuff. Okay. Whereas whereas like you know Daniel is doing book reviews he sometimes interviews authors he's doing fantasy news all this different kind of stuff so i don't know maybe maybe it's just like a disjunction between what people expect as the content creator versus like what comes from 
the author side of things. Yeah. Um, if those mesh or maybe they, they feel like out of sync or something like that, you know, like mm -hmm. with MJ and I is, you know, she was an author before she became a, my co-host. And you guys um, talk about writing and you, yeah, and you and talk like to the whole, authors. the whole podcast is about talking with authors and talking about writing. So it kind right. of fits yeah. where it doesn't feel like out of place for me to say, Oh, I have a book now. Right. Even though, right, you know, right. cause I've been talking about writing and I've been talking with authors for like two and a half years. So, yeah. And then he, even someone like Philip chase, you know, he's such a like high tier intellectual <laughs> that yeah, when, yeah, yeah. when he, when I heard that he had a book coming out, I was like, no, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like, you'd expect him. It's like, why haven't yeah. you had a book come out before, man? You know? Cause he's right. like a medieval historian. He's a yeah. university professor. And it's like, he Hasn't... just brings a level of quality to like, yeah. like intellectual quality to his, his yeah. YouTube videos. And it's like, bravo, sure. sir. And I... you know, Hasn't he done like his own translation of like Beowulf or something? <laughs> like, I don't know about that, but crazy. I would not be surprised. Like I would not put that past Philip. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, man. Yeah. yeah. He's such a such a awesome dude. Well, who amazing, would yeah. really surprise me is Mike from Mike's book reviews. Oh, if he yeah, ever yeah. came out with a book, I'd be like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> I feel like it would be the trippiest shit ever. Cuz Mike is a really great guy as well, but he's yeah. like I feel like it would be like Dune, but like more psychedelic and more heavy metal. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like that feels like a Mike kind of book. Definitely. I wouldn't be surprised if he's writing anything on the side, but he's a great content creator at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit be before we get into talking about like SFF Addicts podcast. Do you want to just kind of do the promo thing of talking about? like what your book is about story wise and yeah. and that kind of thing. And we can, we can kind of get the word out a little bit. Sure. So I'll get the book down here again. So mushroom blues is the first book in the Hoffman report series, which is going to be a four book series. It's the first book as well in the fungal verse sort of interconnected universe. Um, and this story centers around a jaded homicide detective, Henrietta Hoffman, who is in this city, Neo Kanoko, uh, in the midst of this fungal city, in this fungal archipelago nation of Hapon, uh, where she is essentially um, banished. Uh, and, and you figure out over the course of the story, like things about why she was banished. Um, but she's mycophobic, so she hates mushrooms and she finds them <laughs> disgusting, which is really bad for her. Yeah. But at the same time, she has to investigate the murder of a fungal child. Um, and so she, over the course of the story, ventures ar across this city of Neo Kanoko, you know, which is a post-war city that has been uh, bombed out and devastated by the uh, invasion and war that her people, the Caprinians, subjected the native fungal people to. Um, but she also has to team up with a fungal bee cop, which is Koji, this little mm. guy right here. So she has to team up with him in order to get into the parts of the city and, and sort of uh, immerse herself in, in the culture in order to figure out what is going on um, and, and solve this investigation. So, you know, there's a lot of police procedural elements to it. It's very, very much rooted in police procedurals. If you're into that kind of thing, which is where like kind of true detective vibes come in, uh, Blade Runner as well, um, you know, there's a lot of cool sort of aspects to the culture of the city in terms of how people are surviving after a war, how the humans uh, treat the fungal people and subjugate them. So there's a lot of topics like xenophobia and uh, oppression and colonialism and things like that. But then there's right. also just a ton of really cool Easter eggs and, and sort of like quirks like Henry. Yeah throws some cassette tapes on her on her tape deck in her car mm -hmm. uh, and there's a bunch of fun easter eggs for for friends of mine uh, oh, in the okay. names of songs and stuff like that uh, and there's just a ton of cool characters that they meet along the way in order to solve this investigation and ultimately for henrietta this investigation is not only about solving the murder but also about coming to grips with her her past and the and the the things that she's done the the skeletons in her closet and her journey towards sort of awakening and and understanding okay. herself better so 
Awesome. Are the I two two questions are the are the fungal people confined to this uh do you say island? Is it an island? So so it's like an archipelago. If you think of Japan, it's like four main islands. Uh, oh, okay. So there there's there's different islands that form this archipelago. Okay. Um and certain parts of the island are more devastated than others. There's like places that have been heavily bombed. A lot of uh, war refugees have, have sort of uh, come into Neokonoko because there's you know, no opportunity or their homes have been destroyed and that kind of thing. Um, so there definitely is like a bit of a military occupation vibe to how uh, the fungal people are controlled within Neokonoko. And in later books in the series, we'll explore sort of like surrounding areas and cities and villages and stuff like that okay are they so are are they allowed to leave are they allowed to go to like the regular human or is that a spoiler <laughs> so no, none of the fungal people are allowed to leave uh okay. the hapon which is where where they live uh so it's like oh, okay. they're not going across the world to like the places where the, the humans are uh oh. but there will be there will be in future series so i have the Hoffman Report, but my next book is going to be book one in a trilogy, which is set decades in the future and is much more like uh, cyberpunk with like biotech oh. and corporations and corporate espionage and like gangster crime families and all this kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, that one will, that series will show fungal people going to other parts of the world. But at this particular moment, it's like the island and the fungal people are under military occupation. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the uh, the two main characters, do they have, are they like very different personalities, like clashing personalities? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so basically this whole series was like a way for me to explore their relationship. Okay. And s- sort of like a, not necessarily like enemies to friends kind of thing, but like, sure. you know, I like to call it friends in the making. Thank you, Stacey yeah. Nova. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, sort of like a friends in the making type thing where, you know, obviously Henrietta is very averse to, to mushrooms. So the idea of like hanging out with this mushroom headed dude is like, fuck, no, I don't want to do this right now. Right. But circumstances right. sort of like force them together and then they start to open up to each other, even though their personalities are very, very different. They're, you know, over the course of the series it's kind of like a buddy cop relationship where they're Mm. helping each other to grow and they're conflicted and and sort of like and and fighting with each other arguing that kind of thing so their morality is very different their approaches to certain things are very different uh down to the level of like their biology is different so the way that they perceive things isn't the same okay that's cool and does she have to rely on him to like tell me what the emotions of this person are if that's something that he can sense is does that come in handy yeah. to them like solving stuff together that's it's cool. kind of this unfortunate situation where she's like fuck i have to rely on him you know right. and yeah. there are multiple points where it's like they she does have to rely on him in order to move forward with the investigation in order to sort of like clarify certain clues and things like that and then there are times where he's able to rely on her so it eventually becomes more of a back and forth thing uh, but she's kind of like a stranger in a strange land right. and hating that land. And unfortunately, <laughs> he's the dude who's like, OK, I have to be like your obligatory guide to get through yeah. this shit. He's like, yeah. I'm your best bet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then last question about the book. You you narrated it yourself for the audiobook. Do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah. So I've actually changed up my my sort of audiobook situation i oh. i was planning on narrating it myself and i had uh narrated 10 chapters but um there's like 40 chapters in the book and i got mm. to a point where i was like okay i'm actually not enjoying this mm. and i'm the kind of person where it's like if i'm not enjoying something then i don't want to force myself to do it because then sure. it's just going to be like a detriment to the to the final product but right i've had conversations with friends about like ways that I can sort of uh, pivot based on based on like how I'm experiencing the audiobook situation sure. and in good news it's like I just in the last week have uh, found my narrator um, oh. and got her booked for August 
So she's Dude. going to be, yeah. So she's going to be narrating it. Uh, her name is uh, Imogen Church. Okay. Um, so she's done a bunch of, uh, like, particularly applying to like Mushroom Blue. She has a lot of experience with mysteries and thrillers, but she has this like way this British voice that I was like Henrietta in my head is British. The Caprinian people are British. And and so when I heard her voice for the first time, I was like, damn, that is Henrietta, like <laughs> hands down. And it's like, we've really, really hit it off and like talking about tattoos and all this different kind of stuff. And so it's cool to be able to have found a narrator where it's like, I trust in the work that she's done in the past and how right. she can apply it. You know, like her first response in, in my email was like the fungal verse. And she was just like five exclamation points and was just super into like, <laughs> the whole idea and everything like that. So um yeah i'm very very excited so i've got her booked for august and hopefully have the audiobook done and ready depending on how long it takes to upload that that tends to be more of a sure. more of a hindrance than anything like that but like hopefully by you know september october the audiobook will be done and out and i've got her uh booked for all four books in the hoffman report as well so even Dang. though I started this being like, I want to do this myself. I'm a podcaster and blah, blah, blah. It's one of those <laughs> things where you have to realize like, shit, not necessarily that I don't have mm -hmm. the skill set for it, but that it's just not a process that I'm enjoying. And therefore I'm not going right. to like force myself to do it, you know, especially after I've done so much other stuff for this book. Yeah. That a lot of people aren't able to do. It's like the cover, like Felix did the cover, but I did all the typography and like the design layout and everything like yeah. that. I did like the entire interior artwork, all the formatting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, you you figure out the things that you can do and you figure out the things that you can't do and just work with yeah. that. So. I'm, I'm a strong believer in, you know, whatever your hobby may be, whatever your job may be, I'm a big believer in like you can't, you can't do everything. Like even exactly. if you like set out like thinking you can, I've learned in my own life time and time again that I cannot cover every single aspect of whatever I'm focused on. Exactly. Uh, even even when it comes to the podcast, there's been times where I've had to, you know, like outsource logo design or thumbnails mm -hmm. or whatever. Like there's there's times where I'm like I just don't have the bandwidth to do everything. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I think that's awesome that, that you were able to, instead of forcing yourself to go ahead and just be like, nope, I committed to doing this myself. I'm going to do it. Taking that step back and being like, you know, what's, what's best for me, what's best for the book, what's best for exactly. the entire situation and, and finding someone and congrats, man. That's awesome. I'm so glad that Thanks, you were dude. able to find a narrator that that worked with you know what you had in your head. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. It was it was a a few days of panic, like shit, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. But at the very least, like that's the kind of thing I'm used to. And and being an indie author is very flexible. So that flexibility mm -hmm. offers me the, the confidence to be like, okay, uh, you know. Even though there, even though I put it out there that I uh, I wanted to do this audiobook, no one's gonna be pissed off that I said like actually I'm not enjoying the process. I'm gonna find a professional narrator to do it. In right. the end, it's like the people who get the audiobook are gonna listen to that and be like, damn, okay, yeah. um, that that matches like the quality of the expectation and everything like that. And plus, like yeah. just this week, uh, I out earned all of my investment in the book. Um, I saw that. I so, saw this. That's awesome. Yeah. So like. I everything that I invested into the book has has been paid back based on all of my sales and everything like that. And so for me, it's like, OK, I'm in the black. Everything that I earn from now on, I can put towards the audiobook. I, ha I also have yeah. savings that I can put towards the audiobook. And for me, it's just like continuing that cycle of investment and return. And, you know, the fact that the book itself, it's like in less than two months paid itself off. I'm That's, confident that if I if I do the audiobook that it's going to do something similar so. Right. That's wild, man. That I yeah. I saw that and I was I was really impressed. Have you been have you been surprised by like the sales or the number of reviews coming in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Honestly, it's awesome. been it's been insane, man. So, yeah, <laughs> That's like That's cool. I 
I did like the big book tour and all that stuff. And I knew that it's like, okay, I'm going to put all this effort into it that, that, and through SFF addicts and like all the visibility, obviously like, I don't have a platform like Daniel green or anything like that. So I'm not going to be like selling like, you know, tens of thousands of copies or anything. But at the same time, like I have a ton of friends who are indie authors and just the response that I've gotten from indie authors, I know it's a really, really tough market. Yeah. you know and it's like i know authors who sell like five books a month you know what i mean yeah, yeah and yeah. it's really difficult and all the effort that i put in with the book tour all the sort of like the friendships and connections that i made through the podcast and in the community and everything all of that's just really benefited this launch and you know like reception's been super positive i'm like hell yeah mj looks at all the good reviews for me and just sends me (laughs) like the best stuff so that i don't have to see anything that's like one or two or three stars or whatever so she's my she's my little like guardian angel for that stuff yeah um but then like yeah just selling like 600 plus copies in like a month and a half is like holy shit you know (laughs) to think that that that, like that many people are interested first of all and on top of that that they would want to invest money into reading my story and then and then have that like continue for weeks and weeks you know so right yeah i'm just i'm just really grateful and hopefully for (laughs) future books that just like keep that momentum going you know what i mean yeah, for sure. No, that's awesome. Yeah, you mentioned um, you mentioned you know other authors that are are struggling to sell five books a month, and it's crazy. You know, as as just like a reviewer, reader, whatever. Man, there's some authors that like I was reading when we first started the podcast, and just because of. I don't know what whatever it might be like getting discouraged or you know just not seeing enough income from a book or something have just stopped writing yeah. and yeah. me as the reader I'm like dang like I would really like the the third book in that series or whatever but it's like you know that's that's kind of the the give and take of the indie publishing industry right is cuz you're not you're not commissioned for like a set number of books. It's just kind of you on your own putting them out there. I've definitely yeah. seen some authors that uh, they just they didn't hit the marks that they wanted to hit or whatever, and kind of kind of gave up on it. So yeah, especially when it's like you're funding this stuff from the beginning, you know. Yeah. And like my book on in terms of like what I was capable of doing, like I saved myself a lot of money, but it was still like two and a half grand you know yeah 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 which is not nothing and right <laughs> for some people it's like that's significant uh right especially if they're like struggling with a day job and all that kind of stuff um but then i know authors who have spent like five to ten grand which is mm-hmm. to me is like <laughs> shit that's, <laughs> a, that's a lot you know yeah but that's, that's a car not, it's yeah but that's not uncommon and yeah. and it's really difficult to justify it's not difficult to justify writing a book. It's just difficult to justify releasing it and everything that is involved in that. Right. And, you know, like people who get into indie publishing, it can be, of course, super discouraging if you're like, yeah. well, I just dropped like five grand on this book and maybe it sold like a hundred copies. And that that is just kind of, yeah. even if even if some people read it and even if you get some good reviews, if it just doesn't catch on, Mm -hmm. then it's really disheartening and that's the kind of thing that can very easily just be like okay what's the point of doing this anymore you know right right because there's there's a difference between like writing for yourself and and writing for a broader audience but if that broader audience is super small yeah and your books just aren't catching on even if they hit the mark in terms of like quality and storytelling and that kind of stuff if it just doesn't sell then it's like fuck that's that's a tough thing to push yourself towards to be like, okay, I'm working on this, on this next book, but you know, throughout that whole process, you can be thinking of how many few people might, might end up reading this even, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's tough. There's definitely, uh, there's definitely been times where I've, I've heard about authors just like, they're like man this just like isn't selling the way i want it to and it's 
is scary for readers in the way where it's like, well, I don't want to see like the series go go away. But I think that, and again, I'm not an author, so I really don't know. But I would I would think that as an indie author, you would have to at least at the beginning, you would have to be doing it just for yourself because. Mm-hmm. If you go into it like I'm gonna quit my day job and and write and just write all day and then put this book out, if that doesn't hit the mark, then you you know you just quit your day job and mm-hmm. and all this other stuff and that's got to be super super scary. Um, and that's so why I most imagine... most of the authors I know, like even trad authors, majority mm-hmm. of them have day jobs and writing yeah. is their side gig. Like right. if you're a full time author, it's pretty rare. Even, yeah. like on the trad side or the indie side yeah you know what i mean so most most indie authors i know like i'm in a very very sort of lucky situation in that like i'm a stay-at-home dad oh, okay um and and my wife has the day job okay so this is just like a mutual decision that we made like after the pandemic and i had to close mm-hmm. down my tattoo studio and was like well oh, shit okay. we got a kid coming so like what are we gonna do yeah and that that's just like a lucky situation for us but even then like being a stay-at-home parent and writing is not easy like my friend crystal matar she's also a stay-at-home mom it's like Mm -hmm. took her a long time to actually get to the point of like writing regularly and then confidently enough to be like okay i'm gonna put this book out yeah and all that kind of stuff so no situation is perfect no situation is completely easy but at the same time, like most authors are doing it for the love of it. You right. Know? Yeah. Um, but obviously if, if your book's not doing well, then it's like, damn, I don't know if it's worth continuing, yeah. even if it's my side hustle. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine how disheartening it can be sometimes if it's not, uh, you know, meeting the goals that you've kind of set for yourself and whatnot. Yeah. Um, Let's move on to a a brighter topic. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Shit got bleak for a little yeah, bit. I know, <laughs> but that but that's the reality. That if you listen to SFF Addicts, yeah. you know that writing is both a passionate and joyous experience. But mm-hmm. I think more on the publishing and the business side of things, it can get pretty bleak pretty fast. For sure, for sure. Um, well, speaking of SFF addicts, let's talk about like how that got its start. Like, what is mm-hmm. the origin story of that? Um, and remind me, how many years has it been? Uh, has it been going on now? So I started it in August of 2021. So it's like a little more than two and a half years, but like coming up on on three. Okay. And yeah, I just I, I started that because I joined Twitter in January of that year. Cause I just wanted to, you know, connect with sort of like a book community. And that was like, after everyone had experienced so much shit during, during the pandemic and socializing felt like a very weird, distant memory. So I was like, I just, I'm going to join Twitter and just see what's up there and talk about books with people. And yeah, by May I'd, I'd reached out to, I decided like I want to join a blog because I'd done blogging in my past. I was a music journalist in university. So I was familiar with like blogging and, and journalism and sort of like how to approach writing reviews and all this different kind of stuff. And I thought like, it'd be really cool to join a blog and just chat with people about books and and read books and review them and whatever. Yeah. And so the first one I reached out to is FanFi Addict, uh, which I'm really, really grateful now, like looking back on everything. I had a list, but that was just the first one. And, and David Walters got back to me super fast. And yeah. we just had a call and we, we chatted about books for a while. And he was like, hell yeah, man, like I'd love to have you on the team and everything. And then getting to know everyone over the course of a couple months. And by July, I had decided like, I don't necessarily love writing reviews, um, but I love reading the books and thinking about them critically. But I also want to like, take writing more seriously and learn from authors and so i was like okay maybe you can, maybe i can start a podcast and i'd asked everyone at fanfi addict i was like does anyone want to do a podcast with me and they're all like hell no oh wow <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily like they were like i don't want to do it because it's with you or anything sure no, it was like <laughs> it was like just generally nobody had the desire to do it so yeah. i decided like fuck it i'm gonna do it myself and you know just 
started putting together like a concept of how I wanted to do it in the early days. It was, it was doing panels with authors. So I just invite mm. on, you know, like two, three, four authors and discuss a particular topic. But just through fan fight act, it was crazy. Like the amount of, um, sort of like industry connections that it set up and I could just go through a list of authors and be like, I'm interested in talking to so-and-so mm. and someone would have a way of contacting them. Wow, and so, that's cool. Uh, one of the guys that worked at Fam that wrote for Fanfiatic, he was actually the web designer for SPSFC, which is like okay. the self-published science fiction competition. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the people who are sort of like the heads of SPSFC are Duncan Swan and Hugh Howie. So he basically reached out to them, was like, do you want to come on this podcast and they were my first two guests it was like Duncan Swan and Hugh Howie which is like crazy for me because at that point I'd like read wool and absolutely loved it yeah. and loved Hugh's work and was really interested in hearing about how he approached self-publishing and how that landscape had changed and how it was kind of like moving toward the future and after that it was just like consistent you know like every two wow. weeks I'd put out an episode and it was like Episode three, I talked to uh, the founder of The Broken Binding, which set oh, up our relationship over like the, con the the consecutive years, which is why like, you know, we talk on WhatsApp, we have, we have calls every once in a while, and that's how I was able to, you know, reach out to him and sell signed hardcovers through The Broken Binding. Um, oh, and now we're sort of in talks about doing like a potential special edition and stuff like that right so it's like yeah he was my you know like third episode was talking with him and then That's after that so it was cool. like fucking anthony ryan and yeah. sebastian de castell and andrea stewart and fonda lee and all these authors who I absolutely adore their work and they're really you cool recently, people recently interviewed jim butcher <laughs> yeah yeah but it's like it goes like it just all just keeps escalating you know like yeah. last year alone like mj and i talked to paulini we talked to jim butcher we talked to martha wells we talked to so many amazing authors and it just like escalated yeah just immediately where i was talking to indie authors and i was, I was talking to trad authors and hybrid authors and learning so much from them and it was just like wild how quickly it picked up yeah. and you know i taught myself how to edit audio and how to basically use like a like a daw program to record my own audio and then bring everyone else's in and do that. I learned how to do that on a plane ride to Spain and also <laughs> on that same plane ride because it's very long, learned how to edit video in, in Adobe Premiere. So I was like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the whole thing has been super DIY in yeah, terms of like, sure. uh, I do the audio editing, I do the video editing still to this day. I do the graphic design because I have a background in art and illustration and graphic design. So it's like, I do all okay. the graphics for the entire podcast. Um, and so it's just, the whole thing has just been very DIY from the very beginning, but I really <laughs> love, like, I can't believe how much it just, how much it just kind of like escalated yeah. over such a short period of time. Yeah, that's that's such a cool ride. You've gotten to talk to to so many amazing people. I I see somebody pop up on your channel every now and then, or I'm like, oh wow, they're talking to Fonda Lee, or oh wow, they're talking to like Jim Butcher or whoever. I'm like, dang, they've really. Uh, I I would say you've come a long way, but like, I mean, from the beginning, you're I, interviewing I just, like, Hugh Howie. Zero, <laughs> yeah, like I just I just basically approach it as like give no fucks in terms yeah. of who I reach out to um, because I learned very quickly that it doesn't matter who it is or like what their mm -hmm. sort of status is within like the supposed hierarchy of, of sure. authors that for the most part, like obviously if it's someone like Jim, like, you know, we reached out through, through his publicist and stuff like that. But I have now developed like a rapport with the publicists at you know, tour at orbit at Harper Voyager at Titan at DAW Ace books, mm. all these different publishers where it's like, they send me emails uh, as well. Like the one about Jim was just because the publicist like sent me an email and I was like, Oh shit, Jim's releasing a new book and it says interview opportunities. So I'm just going to say, 
fuck it, let's try. You know, yeah. if it happens, it happens. And that's kind of been my attitude where it was like, I really like Fonda's work. I'm going to just reach out and see if she would be interested in talking. And she was, and I've had her on the podcast like three or four times. And Adrian Tchaikovsky, yeah. who's like one of my favorite authors of all time and reaching out to him and he's just super, super cool. And now he's like, I got a blurb on my front cover from Tchaikovsky. Where oh, it's like, that's crazy. You know, where it's like the relationships change once the author comes onto the podcast and like chats yeah. with me or chats oh, yeah, with MJ and I sure. and that rapport just kind of like builds up and yeah. they get a sense of like who you are and, and vice versa. They have a and face to put, not yeah. only a face to put with the name, voice but a voice and, and a yeah. personality. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really I've, cool when, when authors come onto the podcast, like Veronica just, Veronica Roth told this to MJ and I where she was like, that was like the most fun interview I've had in a long time. Oh, sick. You know? yeah, so when someone awesome. says that to us, yeah. it's like, oh shit, that's that's really cool, you know? Yeah. That we can make someone feel comfortable that they'd just be like, right. you know, feel like they're not just running through the the regular routine, especially for someone like Veronica. It's like, yeah. she wrote Divergent, you know? Right. Fucking gigantic <laughs> movie that she's done like, yeah. she's done like, like red carpet interviews and blah, right. blah, blah. And so she has a different perspective of, of an interview than most right. people. Right. And for her to say something like that, MJ just, yeah. MJ just like sent me a message when Veronica posted something on Instagram and she was like, like Veronica just like melted my heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. That's awesome. Real quick, so with you you mentioned that you read Wool. Mm -hmm. Uh have you seen the TV show? I started watching it with my wife like okay. 2 weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Um how far really, are you guys? Really good. We're I think 5 episodes deep. Okay. So, yeah. Dude. Because yeah. it's like when we watch shows together, it's a pretty slow process. I can't just like okay. we can't just like binge stuff because our just kids being kids, man. Right. Um, they make they make life a little bit uh, more unpredictable. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I know everything that's going on, so right. it's kind of cool to be like watching her reaction to everything that's happening on screen as well. Yeah. So just yep. be like, oh, just you wait, just you wait, because yep. I like based on the first five episodes, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty true to what Hugh wrote um, yeah and I imagine that's just going to carry through for the rest of it yeah I so I watched the show first and oh, interesting yeah and I fell in love with it like just pretty much right like, off the dude, bat the cast is just unbelievable it's just like Rebecca so Ferguson just, just fucking kills it it's yeah so good. like it's so it's well so cast good. yeah and and yeah, I became I became addicted to this show, and this hasn't happened to me in a long time. But it was the kind of addiction to a TV show where you are staying up on a work night until yeah. three a.m. to finish an episode, and um, the part where this isn't going to spoil anything for anybody, but where they have to fix the generator. Mm -hmm. Like that, that whole episode, I was up until, cause I, I started it pretty late. It was one of those things where like one more episode, I'll get like a quarter of the way through it and then I'll pause it and I'll go to bed. Right. And that episode was so intense. I was, I was literally on the edge of my seat, like literally, yeah. literally sitting on the edge of my seat, watching this show at like two and, in the morning, <laughs> at like two in the morning. <laughs> And I'm like, I cannot pause this thing. I have to finish it right now. Yeah. And and then there's a cliffhanger at the end too, and you're yeah. just like, now I gotta watch the next episode. <laughs> right. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> every every episode was so just clickable. Like next episode, next episode, next episode, and I loved it so much. Um, and then I read the, I've read the first two books. I've read Wool and Shift. Okay. And but you haven't read Dust. I haven't read Dust. Uh, okay. That's coming up soon. I'm, I'm definitely going to read it. Um, but I, I have kind of a wild take. People don't like me for this. I, I am famous for like ripping apart adaptations and being like, Wheel of Time I sucks. Mean, Rings I mean, of like Power sucks. A lot sucks. of adaptations are really trash. Right. So it's yeah. justified. <laughs> it's justified. Like, really shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, this was the first time 
where I made a video saying Silo, the TV show, is significantly better than the books. <laughs> I would agree with you on a lot of points. Um, Cause I, I just think, think, I just think the storytelling is cleaner in the show. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I think that, and he's like, gotten, I, Hugh's gotten better as a storyteller. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. But, I liked shift yeah. more than I liked the first yep. book, like yep. shift. I really enjoyed. Uh, but the first book I read it and I was like, I was reading it and I'm like, by the time, the, first of all, the generator scene doesn't even happen in the book, which mm -hmm. I was most looking forward to. That was my favorite episode. And uh, there was just so many events where I'm like, I'm reading through the book and it's going, it's going like quicker than the show. Like not, not you know, in like a you know fast paced is, way, but it what's that? That's because of the way it was published. Okay. So originally it started, he started publishing it in 2011 and it was pretty much like he was publishing it episodically. So oh. the whole book didn't come out as a whole book. It started out as like, that makes so it much started sense. out as more like, I'm going to publish this chapter by chapter. Oh my God. Okay. And the reader, the readers are giving him feedback and like, like reacting to things while he's still writing the continuous chapters. Okay, because I was yeah. like, it feels... Whereas Shift, Shift was written as a cohesive right. whole. Whereas, okay, yeah. Whereas I Wool could... was published, like, chapter by chapter. That makes so much sense now, yeah. because Shift definitely felt like, you know, there was a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's, mm -hmm. like, a twist that you're you're kind of waiting for. You're waiting for the mystery to get revealed, and the twist happens, and then you're, like, hooked into the final stretch of the book. Mm-hmm. And shit or um, wool. I remember reading it, and I was like, "I'm like, it's not bad. I'm not having a bad time." But, but it feels like structurally disjointed. Yeah, it feels disjointed, and it feels like you know the show, uh, or or usually if you're watching an adaptation, like take Wheel of Time for example, like the Wheel of Time season one, it's cutting out big swaths of the book to make it yep. into a season. Yep. Whereas the book, it almost felt like it was flipped where like the book was the adaptation and they cut big swaths <laughs> out of the show to fit it into a book because yeah. there was so many times where I'm like, like the guy that she uh, is kind of like, kind of falls in love with in the show Mm -hmm. um, you don't really see him in the book. You don't see like that whole mystery play out or anything. Like it, it I'm, I, if I remember correctly, it, it gets feels, mentioned, yeah, but yeah, but there are like subplots that are kind of glossed over in in a lot of ways in in the book, where yeah. it's like um, there's yeah, there's like a a particular feeling where in the show it does it does it really well, where it's like the tension is is very well controlled mm -hmm. and i feel i feel that in wool the just the way that it was released um kind of robbed the tension from a lot of completely things. um yeah. whereas like it's it was super crazy because like uh andy weir also published the martian in the same way mm. um oh. and so but the martian feels like much more cohesive okay. uh Whereas, yeah, I don't, I don't know like how much time w between the releases, the release of like Wolves chapters versus the Martians chapters, but sure. maybe it's just the, the, the ways in which like the Martian was like seriously just one character interacting with his environment that kind right. of, it narrows it down. <laughs> yeah. It narrows it down and doesn't, doesn't sort of like, uh, introduce characters that might not necessarily get the page time that they need. Um, but in the Martian as well, it's like just his interactions with the environment and him trying to get off the planet yeah. was like, there's no way that you can completely rob that trajectory of its tension. All right. Whereas, whereas wool has so many different spots where it's like, you can completely fumble. I mean, Hugh, Hugh didn't fumble completely at any point in my perspective, but there are parts where it's like, this could have landed so much harder and the show yeah. does that it does it for sure and i think my biggest disappointment with the book like if you if you kept everything else in the book i think my my biggest disappointment was just that 
there were storylines in the TV show that I came to love. And I think going over to the book, I assumed that it was going to have like typical adaptation to, to book reading. Mm-hmm. Like I figured it was going to have everything that was in the show and then some extra context. Right. And it was almost like the reverse where I'm like, Oh, I love this storyline from the show. And then I get to the book and it's nowhere to be seen. Yeah. And so I yeah. think the show did such a good job. Of, it, they, like they, they chose, they chose the right characters to flesh out relationships right. and, sub, and subplots. 100%. And I, I'm usually the guy that is like a purist when it comes to adaptations. I'm like, Nope, keep exactly what's in the book. If you have right. to cut, you know, s- some of the fat out, I totally get it, but keep, strictly what's in the book but in this case i was like man i'm glad that they did do that but they added more on Mm -hmm. top of it and it didn't feel like they were adding anything that was uh lore unfriendly it felt like it was all stuff that was technically in the book but it was just more of that and i think that's such an achievement i think that's so cool i love but you know what i've i mj and i've been talking about this recently and because we do bonus episodes for our Patreon as well, where we just like chat about mm. like the books and movies and shows that were that were that were consuming at the time, right? And just this year alone, it's like I've been really surprised by the quality of adaptations. And I wouldn't even necessarily just say mm. book adaptations because it's like I watched Fallout, and that yes. was absolutely brilliant. Just like such <laughs> so a like good. like what you're saying. It's like it's so friendly to the lore. Mm-hmm. Like it's so dedicated to the lore, but yeah. I'm so glad that they did not do like a one-to-one adaptation mm-hmm. of any of the particular video games. Well, it's the perfect um, world for it, right? Because so in Fallout, so you have hundreds of vaults. Yeah. You could tell any story all across exactly. America. Or that wherever. was like the best move that they could have made. Oh, Same man. thing with, uh, you know, like um, I watched Dune part two and like the Dune movies mm. are also really great adaptations and I was yeah. so happy that Dune Part Two. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Oh yeah. Um, how they just how the director Denis Villeneuve just like really he really hunkered down in terms of like the weirdness mm-hmm. of the Dune universe. And yeah. I'm like, yes, just bring on the fucking weirdness of the Harkonnens. Like, bring on the weirdness <laughs> of like of Spice and the way that the Fremen and their sort of like uh, religious um, sort of inclinations and the way that they incorporate like psychedelics and, and visions and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, he just like, he really dug deeper into that. Yeah. And then I told my wife and I was just like, it gets weirder. Like the books get weirder. <laughs> and I know, like, that's I what know, I've heard, <laughs> you know, like, especially with, with, uh, with Paul's little sister, like when she's in the mm-hmm. belly and like all the shit that was going on there, my wife was just like, what? the fuck is happening with that child yeah i was definitely confused and somebody had to explain it (laughs) yeah like in the books she is one of the best characters but it's so trippy the way that 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 frank herbert kind of like expanded upon things and then also like the last of us that was probably so good that was probably like a case where uh i didn't like the casting but yeah the I think like visually the casting was a bit was a bit like wonky. Off. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of like quality of the casting, in terms of like their yeah. performances, the performances were good. But yeah. in terms of the story in particular, that was such a good adaptation because the the I think like the creative director and like the lead writer of the video game series mm-hmm. was also involved in the writing and production of of the yeah, show Neil, Neil Druckmann was yeah. was right there the whole way along exactly exactly and same with with the fallout show it's like uh, Todd Howard who's the 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 one who I don't know like lead director or whatever of, of Bethesda he's games. like the like, head of Bethesda yeah. yeah so he was directly involved in the video game or sorry in the Amazon adaptation as well so yeah. like and Hugh like I when I first had Hugh on the show mm-hmm. he was telling me about his involvement in in silo oh i didn't and he, even know that yeah but he you know he like he was on he was visiting set he he met the whole cast he was like checking out scripts and stuff like that and so his involvement in that like i think when you have the original creator of yeah the fictional property it comes like someone through who, it comes through because it's like wheel of time really suffered 
rings of power just, yeah ugh. and then i heard like uh just like a like a day or two ago that they're doing like another lord of the rings movie about like oh, search for Gollum or some shit like isn't that isn't that awful oh, like my just God. just let it die just let it but you know the thing let is, it is rest like, in peace like andy circus is involved and andy's andy circus is incredible like the way that he brought Gollum to life peter jackson's yeah, peter involved jackson's too involved, but yeah. then peter jackson was also involved in the hobbit in the, the hobbit, hobbit was a dumpster fire <laughs> it was it's just like a like a flaming dumpster yeah. fire so I think to be fair, the Hobbit movies were trash because Peter Jackson, you know, he was he was he successful with that first trilogy. Yeah. And then when he went on to do the Hobbits, they're like, we're going to put in a bunch of other people to help him out and like co-produce this. Yeah. And it, was it just wasn't like too many just cooks his in the kitchen. thing anymore. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. But but then again, like, I hope at the very least, this is a project that he wants to do and they're going to learn their lesson and be like, let him just do whatever the fuck he did for the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right. Because that him- worked. Yeah. You know? And and yeah, like I completely agree with you that the Wheel of Time was was just terrible. I didn't even bother to start with season two. Yeah. No I was, way. Mm, I stopped at episode mm. five of season one. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I, I'm like I, I watched I watched the Rings of Power, but like I'm not interested yeah. in watching season two. Even even just the intro of Wheel of Time where it's Moraine talking about like the arrogance of man, I'm like, that's not that's not like what the books are about though like i understand yeah. what you're trying to do here but like that's not like the the book the books aren't necessarily like pointing the finger at man seeing saying see your sin led to your magic getting all fucked up like that's yeah. not that that's not like true to like the spirit of the books and i think that it's so important for these adaptations i hope to god that they learn from silo they learn from fallout they learn from last of us and dune the people making the show if they love the source material if they have a genuine love or even Mm -hmm. if they're if they weren't a fan before but then they got told they're making the show and they're like i'll dig into it and see what this is about it helps so much because you look at the witcher where they like hate the sort like they do not like the source no material. you know who's the only person who loved the source material cavill cavill <laughs> yeah and look who's fucking gone <laughs> I cavill. Know. it's like why would you get rid of him yeah um, no like i told my but- wife like we watched up until season three the end of season three and i'm like yeah henry cavill's gone and she was yeah. like what and i'm like yeah we're not continuing the show and yeah she's like i'm, I'm cool with that yeah, yeah, she was she was I, totally fine with that, but it's such a bummer because I love I that property. I love it so much, man. I know, Witcher Three I, is like one of my favorite I games know. of all time, and the books. Even though like some of the books, there's like, yeah, some pretty some pretty like ham fisted stuff. Sure, just the world is so brilliant. Like it's so yeah. goddamn good. And you know what they could have done for the Wheel of Time? How about we just call Brandon Sanderson? Right. How about how about we bring him in as you know like a like an executive producer or something like that you know what i mean yeah dude yeah. finished the fucking series he finished the book well, series he is the next best sort of like creative mind to tap after robert jordan and robert jordan was gone so yeah you know like why not why not call up brendan sanderson and be like hey do you want to help us make this adaptation as good as possible right but well like even now with uh you know when the when the show first came out he was like yeah it was okay like there was some things that like i suggested that they didn't take to heart and like overall it was all right and now after the second season i haven't like watched the video but i saw like a a thumbnail pop up the other day that was like brandon sanderson is now really not happy with wheel of time and so i guess he made another video like tearing into it and i'm like dude i can't I can't blame him like man you have you have such a wealth of of knowledge and skill um and it's like why aren't you using it and you even even when it comes down to the actors you know I don't expect everybody on set or even mm-hmm. the person that's like running the show I don't expect you to have been like I've played these games since I was a kid or I've read these books since I was a kid or whatever right, but right. you look at Fallout and Ella Purnell that plays Lucy she was in an interview recently I was watching this thing 
and they asked her like oh so had you ever played fallout before doing the show and she's like no i never played it but as soon as i found out what i was doing i downloaded fallout 3 and i downloaded fallout 4 Mm -hmm. and i played through those games because i wanted to know why this means so much to the fans and i wanted to bring that through in my performance and she's like i ended up loving the games she's like i'm like an actual fan of the games now yeah and i'm like dude why like, can every why can every actor kind of take that approach? You know, I mean, yeah. obviously, it's like if you're on the wheel of time, you don't have to read all 14 books and the prequel, yeah. of, like whatever. But it's like spend you some can, time in the Reddit yeah. or yeah. you know, like just no, like at the very least, just like fucking read a couple of the books. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, it's just it's bewildering to me, especially with okay. So I'm really happy that Amazon knocked it out of the park with Fallout. Yeah, because that was like okay you it's like you, you guys had, like, see now you see yeah yeah but you had you had like a, a a certain bank of resources like financial and talent and all that kind of stuff right look at how you applied it to rings of power look at how you applied it to the wheel of time and then look at how it went with fallout so right. hopefully that's just like a, a an example for them to be like okay maybe we should rethink how we approach all of the stuff that we do in the future you know yeah and especially like with with lord of the rings because that is such like a monumental property but wheel of time is also a monumental property it's like are you really just gonna fucking just bury yourself in your own hole like dig your own hole with these like billion dollar properties you know yeah and it's like look at the criticisms look at what fallout did figure out how to readjust this stuff for the future and just yeah. i don't know man like it's really it really sucks when it's like and these 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 things that you really that you love like these properties that you love like people who've read wheel of time dozens of times that read them since they were kids you yeah. know people who've read lord of the rings like lord of the rings that that's how it is for me like lord of the rings yeah. books the hobbit the films and then watch, watching ring of rings of power and being like this is just so clunky and so poorly written and just like man i don't know it's like they poured so much money into like cgi and and sets and stuff like that but i feel like they just lost what made the peter jackson movies so good which is like the soul of it right you know it's like every orc just had like soul even though it was a twisted murky soul it was still (laughs) it's still just like oozing personality and and life you know and i feel like life like that that soullessness is what is hindering wheel of time it's what's hindering lord of the rings and so many other adaptations that have just like completely failed over the years yeah well it's like like you know like you said they're just pouring money into the wrong areas like what if instead of trying to make rings of power like the most you know jaw dropping like cinematic cgi whatever like why don't you pay everybody for just a week of time or like even like a few days of time or whatever just to read or just to Mm -hmm. like do research yep and you're like we're gonna pay you for like three or four days for you to do nothing but just read or Mm -hmm. like something like like that would be i think that would that would give so many of the people involved the i guess kind of the perspective and i i think a lot of that it it comes with like the production as a whole like you have to if you're given something like the lord of the rings or even let's take a let's take a series that i'm actually not interested in let's say that i was given star trek and they were like you're gonna make a star trek movie i'm like shit i don't know anything about star trek but i know for sure that it means a lot to a bunch of other people so maybe i should watch like a back catalog of the different series right like or the movies or whatever yeah like when you're given one of these properties you have to know that there's a huge fandom attached to it so it's like are you just gonna be like fuck it i'm gonna wing a star trek movie or whatever exactly, yeah. or are you like i don't know like i know there's fans out there that I mean, are gonna care isn't, about isn't the guy that that 
is like the showrunner for for Wheel of Time, like a big Wheel of Time fan. That's what he says, but I was talking with a bookborn on a creator's corner, yeah. and she kind of has a take where it's like she that's thinks just that's lo- just like a publicity thing. Yeah, it's just kind of like a publicity thing. Like, like she's she's really not convinced that Rafe is is like an actual fan of Wheel of Time. She thinks yeah, that it's I, more of like a marketing thing. Yeah, because it's like the the showrunner for for the witcher is like very blunt about like her distaste for for the books in particular yeah um but no nah, man it's uh yeah maybe it is just a publicity thing yeah I that makes sense though you, she's, Again, bookborn, she's got a great bookborn, video bookborn on is it, like sure. a is a big fan of wheel of time too so yeah yeah she's she's super into it um okay so let's I got one more question about um, SFF addicts, I think. Uh, and we can kind of, then we can go like way off tangent, cool. like we have been. Because <laughs> we haven't already. Just um, furious and, and passionate about adaptations. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to talk about um, bringing MJ Kuhn on. How did, how did that happen? That, yeah, so me and her have like such a good friendship now um not to say that we didn't have a good friendship at at some point it's like no like we've just had like a really quick just sort of like increase in how much time we're talking together and everything like that because yeah she came on the podcast in january of last year so january 2023 and i'd only met her uh, actually, the way we met was was great because we did a. Um, I was doing bonus episodes at that time, so I had like a, you know, like I'd bring people on to discuss like TV shows or movies or whatever. Yeah. And we had uh, we had a, a panel discussing season one of the House of uh, House of the Dragon. Oh, so um, that's another such a good adaptation. And that was just <laughs> so brilliant. Good. But you know, it was crazy. Okay, so uh, I had one friend uh liam quain who's an indie author but he also works in the film industry in in the uk and he just somehow like he got in touch with uh an actor named miltas yoralamu who played serial pharrell in season one of game of thrones oh okay um and so he just like got to chatting with miltas and then and then liam and i had already planned to do this uh to do this uh tv show discussion and he invited Miltos, and Miltos said yes. What? Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so we were discussing House of the Dragon with Liam, and then I also invited MJ on, and then Miltos, who played a, a character in season one of Game of Thrones. Oh, um, shit. <laughs> which is like fucking mind boggling. It was so crazy. He's just like hanging out with us with his cat in his kitchen, and he's like, or his dog, yeah. So I gotta yeah, go back like, and watch these. That's awesome. <laughs> so it was so really, cool. it was really fun. Like he's a super great guy, and and Liam is hilarious <laughs> and super quippy and sort of like in a very British way. And MJ was the other person that we'd had on, um, just because like I I interacted with her on Twitter, but then I was like, hey, like. You know, I know you're you're like big fan of Game of Thrones. Come chat about House of the Dragon, uh, and so that was my first time meeting her. That was in like October, oh 20, really, 2022, and then I had her on the week after to do uh, an episode on. Uh, I was a panel on heists and capers, uh, in in SFF. Uh, so it was like boom, like one week chatting with like MJ and and, and Liam and and Miltos, and then the next week was with like MJ and Robert Jackson Bennett. And and a, and a couple other authors, yeah. But I just got a really good vibe from MJ. That's She's cool. just a really great personality. Like anyone who like people who listen to Fantasy Files have probably heard uh, your episodes with MJ. Yeah. And it's just like immediately you can tell she's like a cool person and really quirky, but like full of personality and really passionate. She brings about the, the stuff energy of the show like up fucking, significantly yeah, just by yeah, being it's crazy, there. Man. It's yeah. so wild what she does. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got that like really good vibe from her and and at that point, like towards the end of twenty twenty two, I was basically thinking like I don't want to do panels anymore because it's like a pain in the ass to coordinate across mm-hmm. time zones and however many authors, etc. 
And so I was like thinking either I'm going to have to stop doing the podcast or I'm going to have to bring somebody else on and like change the format, change how we do things. Right. And so just like with the blogs, it was like, I made a list of people. Yeah. MJ just so happened to be the first. Yeah. <laughs> and so I DM'd her on Twitter. I was like, Hey, have you ever thought about doing a podcast? And she was like, yeah, actually I have. And I was like, do you want to be a co-host on mine? And then I like pitched her on what I want to change it to. And she was like, hell yeah. So That's December awesome. we, we recorded, we just called, we just had like a couple calls and like hung out and chatted and then, uh, recorded our first episodes together in December and then released them in January. And it's just like, we haven't looked back since like, That's you know, awesome. now it's like, we're really good friends. We talk pretty much every day and the show is like significantly better. I think by having not just yeah. me, but also like having kind of like our personalities bouncing off of each other. For um, sure. And then on top of that, it's like, I, met her in person last year which was like oh, wild that's cool. yeah so it's like i went to canada for a trip uh with my son and we ended up going to toronto and she lives in detroit and yeah. <laughs> and she was like i'll drive up to toronto even though it's like four <laughs> hours yeah it's like it's not close uh and then crystal matar drove down from ottawa and we just like met up in toronto and hung out for for a day and or like a couple of days and it was wonderful like it was that's so cool, cool. So it feels like really surreal how everything's progressed, but yeah, uh, it was one of those decisions where it just felt kind of like instinctual, yeah. Like so much of what I do in my life, and mm -hmm. now I'm like I look back and I couldn't imagine it any other way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, she's she's a great fit over there. That's yeah. that's really cool. I've definitely uh, I've definitely caught some episodes since she's joined, and uh, yeah, it seems like you guys have a great rapport. You just a great like melding of the two personalities it's awesome yeah um she there so there was a period of time it was so she came on in like J january of 2023 right yep. yeah so it was like it was that the december of 2022 and we were doing like our year end uh like big year-end wrap-up thing right and Gabe and I had been talking about bringing on another co-host for like a month or two did I steal her from you you did yeah <laughs> we <laughs> like straight Dude, up like, I'm so sorry no but it's, at the same it's time fine. I'm not sorry at all <laughs> I know yeah no she's a great fit over there oh man. uh yeah on on our like big year-end wrap-up we like announced and we're officially looking for a new co-host right now we're thinking either mj coon or uh mick who's our friend from like twitter uh that we had had a lot of interaction with right. we're like we're we're thinking between these two people we're not sure which one we want to go with and and then we're like if there's anybody else out there that's thinking about being a like a podcast co-host like let us know and so then maybe like two weeks went by or something and I had whenever I write out like a really uh, whenever I'm about to send like a really serious message whether it's mm -hmm. to like inscript somebody's help for something or like pay them to do something or whatever I write it out in my in my notes app yeah. and <laughs> I write it out there first and so I, I wrote out this whole thing like like for uh, like to see if she would like become a co-host and I'm literally like in the middle of doing this and I check Twitter and I see the fucking <laughs> announcement <laughs> that she's now a co-host on SFF Addicts. Oh, and I was man. like, God fucking damn it. <laughs> I was so pissed. I got the jump on you, dude. <laughs> yeah. I was like, fuck. And I, I took like a screenshot of it and I texted it to uh to Gabe and I was like, Can you fucking believe this? <laughs> oh my god. Of all the people. So, but yeah. no, it's like you understand exactly what I mean. It's like Yeah. Based on like a couple interactions or a few interactions with MJ, it's like you right. get that. You, yeah, you, know? you just know. Like she's yeah. she's perfect for a podcast, so Yeah. That's great. Yeah, we ended up bringing on uh, our friend Mick, um, and then right now we're actually looking for another co-host. So if there's anybody out there that's that's possibly interested, um, cause, yeah, our our friend Mick, he was on for I don't know, he was a co-host for like maybe six months, and then he just mm -hmm. disappeared. 
and he lives in uh, Australia. And so okay. it's like, <laughs> I, I assume so. I'm like, you know, that, that's the weird thing about the internet is, you know, you get so close with people and you forget mm-hmm. that you don't know them in real life. Like you don't, right. like you're not, you can't just like go over to their house and like talk to them. Right. Um, and so like one day he just like, just stopped responding in the group chat and like can't get a hold of him. So damn, we have no idea what's going on. And I wish that I had gotten um, like either his like fiance's number or something uh, so that I had another way to reach out to him. But yeah, I don't know. And that's, it's just the weird thing about the internet is like, yeah. I, I have no way to work around this. I've, you know, there's nothing that I could possibly do really. So exactly. Yeah. It is, yeah. it is like a really strange thing, which is why it was so surreal to meet MJ and, and, and like yeah. other people like Crystal in, in person and be like, Oh shit. Like you exist. Like, I can, right. Like, yeah. Like you, you have like skin and like, hair yeah. And right. Stuff. I know. It's <laughs> yeah. so crazy. The first time, the first time I met an author in real life, I think it was, I think it was Fonda Lee. Um, and she, she came to Seattle when I was still living there Mm -hmm. and I surprised Gabe. It was like, um, I think it was like his birthday or something. And I got him, I got him Jade legacy had just come out. And so I got him like the hardcover version of that. And I picked him up and we were just like, he didn't know where I was taking him. He knew it was a surprise. And we showed up at, uh, the university bookstore in Seattle He's like, what are we doing here? Are you like buying me like a book or what are we doing? And I like opened up this bag and like handed him Jade Legacy. He's like, you, you already got a book. And I, he's like, what are we doing here? <laughs> and I'm like, you'll see. And we go inside and Fonda Lee's there like signing books. Nice. And it was this huge, awesome thing. And we had talked a little bit on Twitter, but I did not think that she would remember who the hell I am. You know what I mean? I'm like, you're like, a big author and I'm just some random like booktuber and uh, we were in line the guy there was another guy that went up she talked to him for like five minutes and then it was Gabe and I she looks up and she says oh it's Spencer and Gabe from the Fantasy Files podcast and just yeah. pff, just blew yeah, yeah. my mind I'm like how do you even know who we are at all and it was just the craziest experience but we got to sit there and, and talk with her for like 15 minutes and take nice. pictures with her and it was like, man, it's so crazy because I've read your work, obviously, and I've seen you in interviews and stuff, mm-hmm. but seeing you in person, it's just like completely changed. Wow, you're real. Yeah. Like you're a real person. Yeah. Um, no, it was, it was super cool. Like that same trip. So it was like I went to British Columbia first and then went to Ontario after. But the when I was in Vancouver, uh, or I was in Victoria and and met up with my friend Nick Eames. Mm-hmm. Um, cause we've known each other for a long, long time, uh, which still blow pe- blows people's minds. I'm like, yeah, I knew yeah. Nick when he was like, we were working at a restaurant together. No Vancouver. way. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like funny. 12, 13 years ago, more or less. Like we've known oh, each other for a long time. That's funny. Um, and we would just like go to the bar after, after work and stuff like that. And he was writing <laughs> at that time, the novel that he released before, Kings or the the novel that he was uh, trying to get published before Kings of the Wild. Okay. Um, so it's like I've seen his career develop and it's really yeah. really Didn't awesome. Didn't he like is... go up to somebody in the restaurant and just like hand Sebastian them his manuscript? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, like like when I was in Vancouver, I I met up with Sebastian and uh, Kes Veloso and Ben Galley and Andy Peliquin. We all just had, like met up at the at the beach and had like a picnic. It was really <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. It was super That's nice. Cool. And Andy Peliquin's like super fucking tall, but he's such an amazing guy. Yeah. Um, and so it's like so cool to be able to meet these people in person and be like, I love your work, but also like hanging out with you is so great. Surreal, and, yeah. And this August I'm going to Worldcon in Glasgow. Uh, oh, cool. which I'm very, very excited for because it's like not only am I meeting up with friends, like Crystal and I are, are staying together uh, in an Airbnb, like hopefully MJ is joining us, Nick Eames is coming, a uh, bunch of authors, like so many people that I've had on the podcast and That's have become so friends sick. with over the years. It's like, yeah, like we're gonna meet up for dinner. Like I'm gonna wow. go visit the Orbit UK office because uh, we interview James Logan, who is an oh, editor yeah. at Orbit UK. So it's like, we're gonna go visit Orbit. like 
going to meet up with Andrea Stewart and Adrian Tchaikovsky and all these different authors. I'm just like, I'm so fucking excited to yeah. see them all in person. Like Stephen Ryan, uh, we're going to meet up with him and have a, have, have lunch. We're going to meet with, uh, Matt, the founder of the Broken Binding. So it's like Ryan Cahill's coming from New Zealand. It's going to be like a wild, wild time, dude. I'm so excited. I wonder how tall Ryan <laughs> Cahill is. Uh, he's very tall, but there are taller people. Like Stephen Ryan is, is like around the same height or a little bit taller. Okay. Uh, Dave Rag is taller. Um, Justin Lee Anderson is taller than them. There's like a tall oh, really? crew. Yeah, there's oh, like a tall crew. There's like photos of of all of them together they like fancy <laughs> con oh my god you guys are all so fucking unreasonably tall but i didn't expect time, justin like, lee anderson to be a tall guy that's when oh yeah 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 he's got the more, <laughs> like i don't know like barbarian scottish jeans <laughs> right right but no well, i'm just like i'm so excited to to see them all in person because we've had so many conversations online you know we've we've talked like on the podcast tons and tons of times so it's like i see yeah their faces and hear their voices in my head but then like man seeing them in person is going to be such wild a trip. wild experience yeah such a trip do you ever I, I know this is kind of random but it's just something i've been thinking about while we've been talking do you ever um you know you you have so many authors on the channel for interviews and especially when like tbr con happens oh yeah just TV, like, TV con, floods yeah and, like <laughs> i i can't even imagine how crazy that is i would not want to do that myself but huge props to you <laughs> but do you ever have with, with so many authors coming through do you ever have any come in that you and like obviously don't name names or whatever but do you yep. do you ever have anywhere like you like straight up do not like their work like you actively dislike their stuff because and i i, I want to preface i ask this because we had an interview a while back and I, i'm not going to name names either obviously but it's like there was there was a book that was coming out and it was getting a lot of hype all over twitter and mm -hmm. gabe and i were like oh let's read this like we have to read it and before we even started reading it we reached out to the author and we were like hey like, do you want to come on, like, with the release of your book, do you want to come on and, like, talk to us about it? And they were like, yes, absolutely, let's do that. And then Gabe and I read the book, and we hated it. Like, we like we actively hated this book. Um, and so it was a really, really weird interview. And But that's, like, the only experience we've had like that. So I'm wondering, with so many authors coming through, the odds are yeah. greater that... It's only been okay. So TBR cons another thing. I'm, sure. I'm gonna like take that out of the equation because there's sure. so many authors and there are genres that like I'm not particularly like. You're not reading on. all their books. Yeah, right? yeah. Like like there was like a panel last TBR con on like lit RPG and progression fantasy. That's not really my thing. Um, so we're not necessarily like. It's more like the moderators have like a either a familiarity with those genres or a familiarity with those authors and their work. Right. When it comes to the podcast, there's only been one time for me as well. Because okay. I was like in in the beginning when it was just me, I was super conscious about like who I invited on. Yeah. And I had always read their work or at least a book by them before I chatted with them. That's kind of where we're um, at, yeah. So, you know, it's like I like having Fonda on. Like I'd read uh jade i'd read um jade city and was just and i think uh when i first interviewed her i think that was when jade legacy was coming out okay oh no no no! it was when jade war was coming out so the first time i interviewed so i'd read jade city and i was like absolutely adore the city and then ha invited her on and then read jade war in preparation to have her on there's only one case and it happened with mj and i <laughs> where I love this author's other work. Oh, okay. But the particular book that they were, were promoting and releasing at the time, both of us read it. And then we had this, like, this message exchange where we're just like, did you finish it? And I'm like, yeah. And then MJ's like, what did you think? And I was like, I 
didn't really like it and she was like me too and so we had this, this moment where we we're both like it was so it, not that it was like bad from a sort of like quality level mm. but it was just fucking boring like yeah. it was like so meandering and so yeah. just like eh, you know and it's like the characters like neither of us really connected with the characters so it's not that it was like a bad quality novel it was just like not a novel that either of us enjoyed and now i've seen like the ratings and stuff and there are people who are like five stars and blah 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 and it's like that's your prerogative that's totally fine you know it's not like not like the book got like review bombed because it's terrible right neither of us enjoyed it and i've enjoyed so much of that author's like back catalog so okay. it was a really weird experience, really jarring for for both of us to be like, we love their work, <laughs> but then we read this particular book and it was just like, huh, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's all I felt afterward was just like, huh. yeah, that's funny. <laughs> so that okay. thankfully that's like the only time because yeah. every other time that I've read. Was the conversation uh, weird? Was like no, like, because both of us like really respect that author and like right. love their craft and love their other work. That okay. we were able to kind of bask in that, as opposed okay. to like the meh feeling of that particular book. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thankfully, yeah, I mean, it's like I don't know how many authors I've had on the podcast at this point. Probably like so many. <laughs> I, so I would many. say like at least three hundred. Yeah. And then TBR con is like, there's like 150 authors per convention. So it's like, right. Yeah. But that thankfully was the only instance because every other time it's like, I've done enough sort of like prep work to know that I like this person's book and this is the particular subject that we're going to talk about. And therefore it's like, I want to reach out to them. Right. So right. thankfully it's been it's been good but that one particular experience was like shit because you know? both mj and i were like oh man like oh, i don't what know what are we gonna do <laughs> yeah that's yeah. that's how we felt as it got closer to the to the interview gabe and i were like reading this book and typically we don't check in with each other hardly at all when we're reading like we try right. to bring all of that just onto the podcast um and i think gabe's probably better about that than i am but uh yeah with this specific book there was there was a point where it was like maybe like three or four days before the interview and we finally broke and like texted each other and we're like (laughs) are either of us enjoying this like now that i'm in the middle of this book it doesn't seem like a book you would like and then he said the same. it doesn't seem like a book you would like and it, it was just like this weird feeling of like okay all right well we'll figure it out on yeah. the day <laughs> that that's like all you can do is yeah. like we got this shit booked let's yeah. figure it out <laughs> yeah it is an well, unfortunate thing but it's like it can't be perfect every time you know yeah and, for sure and i feel like at the very least like regardless of of our feelings about these particular books it's like yeah we respect the authors yeah you and, can have a respect for the author and and there's like a lot to to glean from what they have to say you know yeah like the the interview and the master class that mj and i did with that author was like fantastic oh that's cool yeah so it's kind of like we could just like shrug shrug aside the right the (laughs) fact that we're just like super meh about that book (laughs) right right well i'll i'll ask a question that's kind of a transition question into our um more like random tangent weird topics Mm -hmm. uh kind of get us from uh you know talking about content creation and into just whatever else are you reading because this is what i'm currently reading are you reading the silver blood promise we mj and i both finished that mj actually blurbed it so she read it back in like oh september i think okay yeah so she's one of the blurbs she's one of the blurbs for for james's book uh and he's he's the he's the editor at orbit uk that i was talking about right right yeah um so yeah i i read it we had him on in april and i think i read it in march Um, okay yeah but really really enjoyed it like it was it was a solid solid book you know it's not like perfect but i think 
for me it like <clears throat> captured a little something about it felt like a like like uh lies of Locke Lamore and nostalgia trip in See, a lot of ways that's, okay that's interesting that you say that because I saw uh Scott Lynch a blurb it and he was mm-hmm. like he basically said like if you like my books you're gonna love this one you gotta read yeah, yeah. it and the cover and and the description and everything I'm like man this seems like it'll scratch the lies of Locke Lamora itch and I'm on chapter 24 right now okay. so I, I haven't like finished it but I'm at least halfway through and it's not that I don't like it um I think it's 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 weird because I haven't felt this book or this way about a book in a long time where like mm-hmm. it's not bad by any means is it just it, not I, meeting certain expectations that you had yeah I think it's probably just not meeting certain expectations I really 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 wish the main character was more clever and more yeah. like capable. Um, he's a, he's and, a bit of a, he's a bit of adult. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, and I typically, you know, I typically like characters that have flaws and like aren't perfect or whatever, but I feel like the main character isn't just not perfect. He's, he's like not able to get anything done. Like he's just not like really good at anything. And I was going into the book really hoping that he would be like a Locke Lamora where Mm -hmm. like he's kind of goofy and weird, but he's very capable and he's very like clever and can think his way out of conniving. And, um, and again, it's not, I, it's so like baffling even to me because I'm like, like there, there is something that keeps me reading chapter Mm -hmm. after chapter. Like after we finish this podcast, I'm going to listen to chapter 25 as I get ready to go do whatever I'm doing tonight. Mm -hmm. But there is another part of me that's just like, man, it's just, it doesn't have that, you know, when you pick up a book, like I just read the powder mage trilogy the first two books in the powder mage trilogy. And there is something, especially in that second book where I'm like, I want to give up time to read this. Mm-hmm. Like I want to, I want to give up whatever I have to give up to read this. And with this book, it's sort of engaging, but it's not like, I'm like, yeah, I'll set it down for a couple days. I'll come back to it. And it's yeah. like, it doesn't have that. Like it I would sacrifice my firstborn to read this you. book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I understand so, that. Yeah. It's, yeah. um, I think. And it's his me, debut, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I went into that book with zero expectations because I didn't even read a synopsis. MJ just like, she blurbed it and really liked it and said like, we should have James on. So I was like, okay. And then it like came up on my TBR and I'm like, cool. She sent me like a, like I didn't even have like a, like an arc necessarily. I had like a PDF proof from (laughs) September. Um, So... I went into it with like very little expectations and yeah. came out of it uh, not necessarily loving the main POV, Lucan, mm-hmm. but adoring Flea, who's like Flea his, is great. his yeah. sort of like little street urchin sidekick. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's really great characterization in that book, but not just not necessarily that I, I loved Lucan, who's like the, yeah. main, who's like the POV character. Um, but like the world building really reminded me of Loc Lamora. Yes, um, definitely. And sort of like the, sure. sort of like the structure of certain parts of it. Um, mm-hmm. To me, it's like I told James this. I was like, this reminds me a lot of Indiana Jones. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, specifically, yeah, like uh, the third movie, uh, um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Okay. Where it's kind of like, here's this dude who's like sent off on a quest that sort of like involves his 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 father and and all this kind of stuff and there's like sort of um the situations that he gets involved in where it's like the the way that he's traveling across the world um the way that he has to find certain artifacts and and you know like break you know uh like break into places he's not supposed to be like a lot of it felt very much like an indiana jones adventure to me more Uh so than like uh lies of Locke lamora kind of like heist sort of uh structure yeah so like i felt like the the main character wasn't what kept me going in that book yeah 
for um, sure. And it is a pretty it is a pretty long book, so it's like not yeah. short by any stretch of the imagination. It's like five hundred plus pages. Um, yeah. But Flea was just an amer- amazing character. Um, there's like a ton of side characters and sort of like for me like the thing that really irked me was the main mystery of like yeah what happened to his dad right right the farther the book goes along the more that feels like uh sort of how would i say it the less it matters Mm -hmm. yeah like i I feel like like after having finished the book i'm not going to spoil anything sure but i feel like all of the book doesn't answer that question oh okay it's like i still don't know what happened to his dad (laughs) Oh, okay interesting so i obviously book two is going to work towards answering that right but for me it's like when there's like a central mystery when there's like a central kind of like driving force as to like here is the inciting incident of what got this lucan dude yeah. off his ass and on the road right i want to know why you know right and, and for me it's like there are inklings of of why but i don't really have a clear answer for it so i yeah. feel like the the core is mystery is that a bummer or is that it's a bummer that I have to wait till book two to get right m- to get more of the answers that I want. It's right. like not it's not enough, and it's like most yeah. of most of the book didn't spend the time that I thought it would have spent on that core mystery. Sort right. of like okay, other mysteries took precedence over <laughs> over yeah. that one. Yeah, so, I could definitely see it going that way for sure. Yeah, okay. but like overall, like it's a solid de- solid debut. It's not yeah. like it's not like completely blew me away and mm-hmm. james is a really amazing guy and has edited some incredible books yeah uh, like he he was like one of the main editors on like andrea stewart's uh like oh, bone, cool. Shard bone daughter Shard. Yeah. and all those books fucking adore them like amazing yeah. stuff. i still need to read the second one i've only read the first one and i it's loved so it i don't good. know why i haven't read the second all th- one yet. all three all three books in that series are phenomenal like oh, so man. damn good i think but, yeah. i think at this point i need to reread the first one honestly yeah. But yeah, it's just like a. It's it's one of those things where you're not like, it didn't blow me away, but I'm not like completely bummed that I spent the time reading this book. Yeah. 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 So I, I totally I totally understand you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm glad I'm glad that it's not just me. I'm really <laughs> interested to see because it kind of seems like a like a Twitter darling right now. Like all these big booktubers oh, they, like have gotten it in their hands and they've done an amazing job of marketing his book. Yeah. Because I'm like he I'm, he's like he's published by Tor in the U.S. Yeah. and so Tor has been. It's kind of like they're treating it as like a bit of a lead title for for this, you know, the summer. I guess. Yeah. Um, so they put the marketing budget behind that, um, right? Okay, which is good for him and good for the book, uh, but also in terms of what I know about publishing from behind the scenes from authors who I know, yeah, uh, it is a bummer when some books get that budget and others just get completely pushed aside. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty wild. I, I'm interested to see how the reviews turn out over the next couple weeks because yeah you know i'm i'm interested to see if it's like if it like really just resonates with like a particular audience like maybe people that haven't read lies of lock lamora i wonder mm-hmm. if it would really resonate with people that like haven't or who, people read who, that people yet. who are like waiting for a sequel to republic of thieves yeah yeah God, I, I want i want thor november lane so bad <laughs> <laughs> so bad me too man that's actually uh, like the only one like People are kind of like pissy about Doors of book Stone. Three, Doors of Stone, or um, what's the Winds of Winter? Yeah, yeah. But I'm kind of like I'm kind of over that now. Like I don't really give a shit anymore. Yeah. But the moment Thorns of, Thorn of Emberlane drops, I'm oh, all yeah. over that shit. Oh yeah, like, I dude. am all over it. Such a good series. Yeah. So incredible. That would be like if if MJ and I could get Scott Lynch on the show. That would oh, that would dude. like. That would be for her because she like legit named the fucking city yeah. in her book after after Lies of Lamora. Yeah, yeah. 
like tales of tamor tamor comes from kamor so it's mm-hmm. like if i could get scott lynch to come on the podcast for her yeah she would just like <laughs> lose her mind yeah it was so good that would be so great um so as we kind of move into like a more like off topic stuff i have to ask you i don't know why I don't know why I get this vibe from you. And you mentioned earlier that you were in like music blogging or like, uh, yeah, like music journalism, music yeah. journalism. Are you a fan? You, you just give me the vibe that you would be a fan of like pop punk, like blink One Eighty Two and like that kind of section of I, music. I grew up on that, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> my, my vibe when I was growing up was like some 41 in blink 182. Yes, dude. Yeah. Yeah, some yeah. 41 yeah. is so some much 41. better than people give them credit. Some 41 for. is Underclass a Canadian hero treasure. Is the best. Yeah. So good, man. So good. So dude. yeah, I, I grew up on that, but okay, my, cool. my music tastes were like all over the place. Sure. And whatever, but like, that was that was the age where I was like finally starting to come into my own as like a yeah. music fan, where so much before was like, um, it was like hand me down music yeah. from my older brothers kind of, but then I was like okay like some forty one Blink one eighty two I also really like Linkin Park yeah um, at that time as well but yeah have, very much have- very much on that. Have you ever listened to uh, Neck Deep? They're kind of a newer pop punk yeah, yeah. band that yeah, came yeah. out. Dude, you know what's crazy is you look so much like the lead singer. Have you ever been told this? <laughs> no, I don't even know what they look like because I've only okay, heard their music. I'm going to show you. Never... I'm going to show you right now. Look at this. Okay. Okay, so right. here's you, right? Yeah, yeah. And here's the lead singer of Neck Deep. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that yeah. not like super we have like uncanny. a very we have like a very familiar like facial structure yeah yeah not necessarily hair but like facial sure. structure yeah isn't that the weirdest thing that's crazy <laughs> holy shit man yeah yeah i thought that was super <laughs> funny <laughs> thank you for that deep cut <laughs> yeah for sure for sure but yeah i i had to i had to ask because for some reason i was like i just get the vibe that he's really into pop punk and that was like not so much That's anymore, like but like I had, thing. I had my era. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I was really into uh, Blink One Eighty Two. I actually just saw them recently when they got back together with Tom. Oh, cool! Um, so that was awesome. After and he then, had his like his like you know like alien alien vibe. thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, he opened up the show with uh, we were like like all the all the lights were down and like somebody's like kind of strumming the guitar like really low just kind of like background noise and they're all getting set up on stage and you can tell that it's like starting to ramp up to them like turning on the lights and them opening the show (laughs) and it opens up with like just a spotlight on tom and he goes i was right about the aliens you motherfuckers and then they just started like (laughs) jamming So oh my sick. god, dude! He's been proven right, man. Government <laughs> records, all that shit. <laughs> oh, it was such a. I don't think I've ever laughed harder at like that the is opening brilliant. to a show. What a way to start a show, huh? What is it's so great? Dude. <laughs> it was so good. Oh, um, yeah, they were fantastic. And then I wish I had seen seen a Sum Forty One live back in their day. Like Underclass Hero is one of my um, favorite albums. I went to Warp Tour. I can't remember oh, cool. which year, but I saw yeah. them there, and it was, they were really good. That's cool. This is like this is like pre 2010s. Yeah. So I can't. Do you remember? remember the... Do you remember like the Project Revolution tour with like Linkin Park, Green Day, Yeah, yeah My yeah, Chemical yeah. Romance, yep. Sum 41? Like they were all that was there. like that was like the fucking golden greatest age. hits like. Dude. golden age of everything yeah right like yeah. lincoln park had just dropped minutes to midnight green day had just come out with well somewhat recently come out with american idiot mm-hmm. my chemical romance had just come out with the black parade and some 41 had just come out with underclass hero yeah and i wanted to go to this concert so bad i was like <laughs> i was too young like i didn't have any money and like my mom wasn't gonna pay for it or anything but it's the one it's the one concert that I look back on. I'm just like, I wish I could have gone. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There was, there was like that, that for me, like once I got into high school, I started getting like really big into electronic music and I oh, managed yeah. to, I managed to see Daft Punk live. 
oh. uh, in 2007 during their alive alive tour. But I had to go to Seattle to see it. Okay. Um, so I went to Seattle with with a friend of mine, and we just like stayed at a hostel, and then like went and saw Daft Punk, and it was like one of the greatest fucking nights of my life. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool. That's great. Yeah, I got I got into electronic music maybe. I don't know, maybe like six or seven years ago, and I was mm-hmm. into it for a solid like year and a half to two years, and then it kind of like fell off, and I've kind of been all over the place. There was a period of time where, um, you know, I wasn't really listening to a whole lot of music in general, mm-hmm. and as dramatic as this sounds, you know, there, there was a long period of time where I was just listening to like podcasts and audiobooks. Yeah. And I had gotten out of uh, a pretty long relationship that I was in, and we had listened to a lot of like Blink-182 together, a lot of Country together, a lot of the stuff that like I would typically listen to. And then after we broke up, it was kind of like this big thing. And I was like, I just really don't want to listen to any of that stuff. Like, I feel like we, everything I would, you. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, everything I would normally listen to is something we listen to on the regular. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, I think I just kind of want a break from music in general. And so there was like two or three years where I legit did not listen to music like at all. And I just listened to like podcasts and audiobooks. Yeah. And that's around the time that we started the, uh, the uh, the podcast um but yeah it was a really weird feeling just being like yeah i just don't want to listen to music like at all yeah it's really weird i totally feel you that happens sometimes it's like it happened yeah. to me with video games it happened to me with it's happened to me with podcasts too like i do yeah. my own podcast but there are times where i'm just like i don't want to listen to any podcast right now i know <laughs> i know yeah. spend so much fucking time doing my own like yeah for sure <laughs> yeah yeah I've I've actually been listening to a lot of uh, John Mayer recently. Oh, nice! Do you, do you ever listen yeah, yeah. to him? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't like gotten deep into John Mayer, but I'm not like opposed to his music. Right. Yeah. Like, he's I, actually a very talented musician. Dude, he's so talented. I was watching a live thing the other day from like way back in the day. Be, like, it was probably either right around the time or just before he like really took off Mm -hmm. and just the stuff he was doing with the guitar. I I have a friend. He's an insanely talented guitarist. It's so wild. Like I don't play guitar, but I have a friend uh, that I was watching that with that is very, very good at guitar. And he was like explaining to me what John Mayer is doing. And even he was saying, he's like, I don't even understand like a portion of what he's doing. Like it's so incredibly advanced. Um, and it's just like, man, it's so, it's so awesome just to listen to him. And he's got such a great voice. What a talented yeah. dude. There was, uh, <laughs> I was, I was dating this girl when I was like, I think I was 17 and she had a big ass John Mayer poster, like at the head of her bed. And we were, we were just like, cause he was so well, sexy, man. He's so sexy. <laughs> he's so hot. And we're like. We're like laying there and we're like talking about like different musicians and, and we're John talking Mayer about like staring down into your John, soul. John Mayer is just staring <laughs> down with this sultry look and she oh said God. she said something to the effect of uh, she's like just so you know if I ever got the chance with John Mayer like I'd have to take it mm-hmm. and I'm like I totally get it I'm like yeah. I would not hold it against you like whatsoever mm-hmm. like go for it please <laughs> yeah I'm like he's such a good looking guy uh but <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, your good that's your your uh yeah that's your hall your, pass yeah that's your hall pass right there <laughs> <laughs> sure. oh, dude. well let's see what else do I have here um oh I have a weird question I was thinking about this recently and I think I heard somebody else on a podcast talking about this somewhat recently So July is coming up, right? It's within like a couple months. And every July, my mom does this thing for like a week where she's like, it's Christmas in July. And she like brings out all the Christmas decorations and decorates. I've never heard of that. You've never heard of Christmas in (laughs) July? No. No, I wonder if it's a US thing. It's pretty, it's like a pretty popular, popular thing. I wouldn't say that everybody does it, but everybody knows what Christmas in July is. Okay. And, uh, and so she does this thing where she like 
decorates literally the house top to bottom except for the lights outside she'll decorate the in interior of the house top to bottom in christmas decorations and then you know as it gets to like not even november like it's like october and she's putting up like christmas lights on the outside she's decorating the house in christmas shit not even waiting for thanksgiving not even waiting for thanksgiving <laughs> not even waiting for halloween and Damn, dude Skipping holidays, left and right. Skipping holidays, dude. What? <laughs> and so I'm like, what is what is the earliest? Like, what is the bare minimum that you can start setting up for Christmas? What what is the what is the most like? Where is the exact cutoff date where it's like a day earlier? It's way too fucking early. A okay. day later, it's fine. Okay, so I'm in I'm in a, a weird middle ground. Okay, so like I'm Canadian, so we have Thanksgiving in October. Oh um, shit! Really? Yeah. So it's like oh, first yeah, month. Yeah. So it's like okay. uh, second Monday in October. Okay. And so in November we have nothing. But now that I live in Ecuador, um, it's like just like so many Catholics, and yeah. they also have uh, Dia de los Is there Muertos. even a Thanksgiving over there? No, no. I okay. I I, I co opted <laughs> Thanksgiving and brought it in just into my like my wife's right. family. Um, okay. But they have Dia de los Muertos, which is like Day of the Dead, and that's at the beginning of of November. So oh, we have okay. that kind of like as like a Halloween signal, a signal that like, okay, Christmas is coming. Oh, okay. So for me, for us, basically like November, we don't do anything. First of December, that's like the time where we're like, okay, we'll get yeah. into it because there's no like like climate signal that like winter oh, is coming right it's like okay. like snow doesn't exist here right right um it exists as like very very frozen ice on like very hot very high volcanoes and like mountains and stuff like that but like okay. like some people in my wife's family have never seen snow in their entire life so we <laughs> don't have the like nature to signal to us that like christmas is coming so we're just like first of december let's roll into it right yeah okay interesting that's cool yeah i would say for me um yeah i mean i'm not i'm not really like a christmas person in general like i just don't that's totally fair i i don't know and i i wonder You're if like, it is december 24th <laughs> yes <laughs> and then I exactly clean shit up on the 26th <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> i'm just like i i I don't know. I think it's it's one of two things. It's either growing up with a mom who is like hyper fixated on Christmas because I mm. think it just like made her like feel happy or whatever and it gave her the dopamine of like having Christmas stuff around. Right. Um but I never like got that dopamine from it really. Uh, you know, when I was really little whatever I I did, but as I got older I just it, it's just not the thing. Like Halloween is the thing that would give me dopamine yeah. like seeing yeah like the leaves change dopamine and, and sugar high and sugar high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think it, it's either that or it's, it could also be a combination of like, like I'm single, I'm not married or whatever. And so Christmas for me, it's like, I'm not spending it with like a family that I've like created. Right. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, family, like with my mom or whatever, but it's not like, it's not like an intimate family thing. Right. And so I think that's kind of part of it too, where I'm just like, yeah, Christmas, like just kind of like reminds me that I'm single, like same with Valentine's day. Right. So that's totally fair. I mean, so, for us, for us, it's like most, it's mostly about the food. Oh yeah. Like we spend a lot of time cooking and yeah. not much time on like presents or anything. Right. And right. My, my sons and my sons are so young anyways. So we're just like, you don't know what's going on. You know? Right. Yeah. You don't know. <laughs> For all you know, it's midsummer. Yeah. Legit, man. It was like. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking Celsius, but it was like 25 degrees out. So. <laughs> what is that in Fahrenheit? Uh, probably that? somewhere in like the 70s or 80s. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I hot think I think in the Christmas. 80s. Yeah. <laughs> I think I can't remember, man. I can never do the conversion. I know. I know. Why don't we Seven, all just switch to metric? Like, why don't we all just switch to whatever the fuck the UK has? Like, yeah. I, I like, yeah, it just especially Not just the when UK, you, like the entire world, except the entire for like world, three or four like, countries. <laughs> like, and you think about it, like from from what I understand from my limited knowledge of the metric system is it's all based in tens. Yep. And America, it's like. Why are we? Why do we have like a base twelve? 
like a, a foot is 12 inches. Do you yeah. know how fucking hard that math gets after a while when you're yeah. dealing with thousands of feet? Yeah. Mm, and I, I work so, in like, construction, in Can- so I have to figure that shit out. <laughs> yeah. So in Canada, it's like millimeter. Yeah. Yeah. So it's got, got like millimeters converting to centimeters. And it's like, okay, so what, one centimeter. And then you multiply that to 100. 100 centimeters is one meter. And then multiply that again. A thousand meters is one kilometer, and it's just like okay, this is, this is easy shit, man. But yeah. then Canada has this bullshit where they're like close enough to the states where they still use feet, they still they're use like inches. They're like mixing it up. They're mixing it up, and I hate it so much. <laughs> I'm like, get your fucking gallons out of here, man. Give me liters. Right, I know. <laughs> Well, we do have to get out of here in a few minutes, but I wanted to ask, because okay. um, I hit you up about this ahead yeah. of time. I said, what is your favorite book of all time? Like, whatever you think the most well-written book in every single aspect is, like, what is your favorite and what is your worst? And so I'm interested to see what you picked. Okay, so will start off with fave. Okay. Jade City. Jade City. Jade City, man that book just like not only because Fonda is like such an awesome person yeah but because this book like captured so many things that I love so it's like I've talked to her about how much she loves like uh the godfather and uh sort of like crime fiction and crime films and stuff like that yeah and that's the kind of stuff that I grew up on you know it's like I love movies like The Departed, Casino, yeah. Godfather, Goodfellas. Like I adore all of that. And the fact that she captured it so well in a fantasy setting, but on top yeah. of that, just like absolutely stellar world building where the world is so interesting. And it's like, I love crime movies, but I also love Hong Kong action films and like, and, yeah. and sort of like martial arts cinema. And so that aspect of like, this Asian inspired world with gangster crime families and they do martial arts, but their martial arts are enhanced by magic. And the magic system is so cool where they're able to use this Jade to like enhance their speed or their strength or all these different things. But on top of that, like the thing that she really did was like Jade city set up this world so well because of the characters like these characters once i got through books one two and three and i finished jade legacy i fucking cried like i cried oh, yeah, during that dude. book it Who was didn't, so right? oh my God. so good like the way that yeah. she just establishes these characters and their motivations and their relationships and just builds on that in jade war and then and you're following like, them for decades so you decades feel like you've man lived with these people. but that's exactly like the feeling that 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 you get when you watch like the godfather trilogy mm. it's like you watch those movies and it's like oh my god the way that things just fucking fall apart and right. just break your heart is so brilliant but i also really love just like her prose style is very it's very recognizable but it's also very like like concise and and Mm -hmm. purposeful yeah there's not there there's so few wasted sentences and yeah like i i wouldn't say that it's quite the workman style of like a sanderson but it's it's not like super flowery either but there are certain sentences where you're just like wow that was fantastic but um, I think like I think it comes out so much with like the character interactions, yes. like like yeah. the things like her dialogue is so good. And the dialogue, some some lines of dialogue are just like God damn, just like the, the characters feel you. like they're not they're not like these kind of vague people in a fantasy yep. world. They feel like actual real people that yes, like you hear a conversation between them and you're like, yeah, I could totally see. Uh, you know that being like the brother sister dynamic between exactly Hilo and and Shay and yeah. Um, did you read then, uh, Did you read Jade Shards? No, I haven't read Jade Shards, but I do have oh. the Jade Setter of Jan Loon. Have you read that? Uh, this is so good, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. awesome. So I was pissed. Jade, that Jade I was... Setter of Jan Loon is like uh, yeah. This is like the novella, and then Jade Shards is the short story collection. But I, yeah. I wasn't able to get my hands on that. Me neither. I it it was like a month ago and I realized that Jade Shards had come out and I'm like, fuck, I forgot to order it from Subterranean. Yeah. <laughs> and But I got uh, this one and I and I had it sent to my parents in Canada. Oh nice. Yeah. Nice. 
Because I was like, yeah. I need to know that this to get somewhere safe. <laughs> right, right. Dude, you're going to love Jade Shards. I just oh. read it like a couple weeks ago. and it is... is it available in ebook or is there a way to order it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I did the audiobook. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got to get on that because yeah, I yeah. like adore it's very anything good. that Fonda writes in this world. Yeah. It's so fun and good. And there's little notes at the end of each one where Fonda like directly talks to. This is why I wanted to write these characters and like right. has like an author's note at the end. It's really nice. really cool. Yeah. Dude, that's amazing. She's the best. Yeah. Um, so okay, what's your but worst? On, the, on the flip side, okay. There are like definitely some terrible books that I read as a kid. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like my adulthood, there's one book that stands out as like, I just like fundamentally did not enjoy it. And it was really disappointing because it was like, uh, so this uh, British author, uh, John Le Carré, who's like really well-known um, like for his Cold War spy thrillers and, and, and everything. He was writing in like this, I think like 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, pr probably most well-known is like because of the movie adaptation, but Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Okay. Um, and there's this one series that he has. Uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy is like later on, sort of like an adjacent series. Uh, but there's one book like my brother my older brother is a huge fan of these books so he kind of got me into them okay. but I was like it's a series so I'm going to start the series from the beginning oh, um, no. there's one that is like my absolute favorite which is the spy who came in from the cold which is set in Berlin and it's like I lived in Berlin and read it in Berlin and it was super super cool to be able to like experience that um, but the first book Call for the Dead is okay Okay. Uh, that one doesn't feel like too much of a spy thriller. It feels more like a sort of detective mystery type thing. Okay. Book two, which is called a murder, a murder of quality, is absolutely terrible. Oh no! Like it's so terrible, and it's basically like it feels like a mystery, but like in like a college town, and it's like centered around like a basically like students and people who like work and live around like a university but everything about it is just so terribly done like oh, the shit. the characters are all boring as fuck like they're all like their motivations don't make sense the way that he like conveys information is super kind of like convoluted and 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 often very confusing where oh, it's like dang especially in a mystery where where you want the information to be laid out clearly it's yeah. like the the investigator george smiley and it's like the series is called george smiley because he's sort of this like central character that kind of goes from one to the next okay but he's like coming to conclusions based on information that i don't understand that like he doesn't have yet <laughs> no 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 that he has but it hasn't been properly conveyed to me oh as I the see. reader and so it's like, okay, so he's like jumping to conclusions based on shit that I don't know. Like, I'm just confused about everything that's happening. And yeah. then on top of it, it's like everything feels so inconsequential and just kind of like not necessarily the type of mysteries that I love, which are like, you know, kind of like small town cozy mysteries. Like yeah. I love like Agatha Christie work sometimes, even though like the character work is often pretty mediocre. Right. But in this particular book, it's like, okay, there's like students who I don't give a shit about. There's like a professor who I don't give a shit about. Here's like some <laughs> housewives who I don't give a shit about. All the characters just like, I just don't care about anything that they're doing or the motivations for like why this particular person was killed. Right. And the mystery just like, oh, it just, it just progressed in such a nonsensical way. Dang. So it was like, it was really strange to be like, I want to start the series in order to get to this point uh, and to have someone who I trust be like, that's a really good book. Right. But then I read like a mediocre first book and it's just like a truly terrible second book. Right. And then I get to the spy who came in from the cold and I'm like, okay, now this is like, I understand. Like it felt like this writer wrote two books who he sh like that he should not have released Yeah. in order to get the shit that he was good at wow yeah and it was just like man and because he, he's like a huge huge author like he's massive like especially in the uk and his books have been adapted into movies and tv shows and 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 what have you but i'm oh, like shit. man those first two books like the first one's like not great second one is yeah. just 
trash. Like a murder of quality is just not a good book. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It's and it's ironic. The book is called A Murder of Quality. Quality this is not a book of yeah. quality. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um so my my favorite ever is and man, it's so hard to say like my favorite ever, but I think like the most well-written book that I have read <clears throat> um, that just hits the mark in everything from like setting to characters to especially the dialogue to just like magic system and like mystery and a twist at the end and everything is the second book in the King's Dark Tidings series by mm. Kel Cade. Nice. Um, and if I was going to recommend one series to you today, it would be King's Dark Tidings. I, I think, have not read it. I have not dude, read it. So I I bleed King's Dark Tidings. I love this series so much. Uh, we were lucky enough to have Kel Cade on the show about nice. a year ago, um, and it is it is just one of the most fantastic series I've ever read. But especially the second book, uh, Kingdom of Madness. Yeah. Uh, or no reign of madness that's what it is um is so fantastic you you could read the first book and in i recommend the audiobooks because they're done by nick padel <clears throat> and so they're amazing they're like top top of the line um the first book is great like i i had a great time with it right from the beginning i understand if you could read the first book and be like it was fine but I tell everybody, if you're going to try the series, the first book is like a five-hour audiobook. Just read that as almost a prequel mm -hmm. and then read the second book. Because the second book is just – it's one of the best books I've ever read. These characters have such incredible dialogue. I, I don't think I've ever read another book where – all I wanted to do, like, fuck the action, fuck the mystery, all that. I just want <laughs> these characters in a room together, and I just want them to talk because the dialogue is so well written. I just want to hear them yeah. talking to each other about literally anything. And there's a portion of the book where they're going from one continent to another, and it's kind of these – these people that don't really have a ton in common, um, they've all been put on this boat for a specific purpose that none of them are aware of besides the guy kind of running the show. Mm -hmm. And um, it's almost like a... You know how, like, that feeling when you're watching, like, a murder mystery, like a Knives Out or something? You have these people from all over the place that are very different, and they all come together, and they're like, why are we all here? And they're kind of mm -hmm. trying to figure that out. That's what this is, but it's on this boat... And a large chunk of the book, a couple chunks of the book, are them on this boat, boat kind of traveling from place to place. Yeah. And it doesn't get bogged down. If you're not into ships, that's totally fine. It doesn't get bogged down into, like, this <laughs> whole seafaring thing. Yeah, it's yeah. just It's just a place for these characters to be, to talk about what's going on in the rest of the kingdom and this king nice. who might be going mad and trying to hide it from the public and people are trying to cover up for him and just these characters who are like some of them are bullies some of them are like you know little like peasant commoners some of them are incredibly skilled swordsmen that people don't really know that they're a skilled swordsman mm -hmm. all these people are together and they're having these conversations in the most interesting ways and it's just incredible and then you know they get to a, a tournament where and this isn't really spoiling anything but they get to a tournament where there's going to be all of these duelists from all around the world uh going one on one and like fighting each other basically to the death and um and like that whole thing there's like a whole mystery behind that and it's like it's like is it rigged and you're like trying to figure out like if like why is this person like continually winning when he's faced with like better opponents than him? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's this whole thing. It's the whole package. And I love this series so much. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's one of my most favorite books of all time. Very down. cool. Yeah. I'm looking at it on Amazon. This is very telling. Book yeah. one has 7,168 reviews or ratings. Uh -huh. uh, book two has 9,050. Yeah. And it's very rare for a second book to have more ratings than the first. Right? 
That's yeah. crazy. It's like it has the most incredible. ratings out of all five books. Yep. The is particularly book is... is particularly Reign of Madness. Yep. <laughs> wow. So I highly recommend it. Do you do audiobooks? Not too mo- not too often though. No. Okay. Just just because well, of like time, like I I don't yeah. have too many opportunities to listen to them. Oh, interesting. See, I would think that audiobooks would give you for me it gives me more opportunity to listen while i'm like driving or working or whatever no but it's like as a stay-at-home dad like i'm yeah, not like that's true yeah going places i usually have right. to keep my ears open in case like that's shit goes around true. yeah <laughs> so, i didn't even think about that that's yeah. true um okay so i i have to get out of here so my yeah man. my worst book uh i could say i feel like the easy one would be the land by and I used to know his name, Alaron Kong, the land series by Alaron Kong. This is a uh, lit RPG series that my co-host is in love with. Mm -hmm. And I think it's absolute trash because the story makes no (laughs) sense. Uh, The characters don't make any sense. They're all like cardboard cutouts. And it's like, it's like watching a very badly done anime. I don't necessarily hate (laughs) anime, but it's like, it's the worst anime. But when anime is bad, it's bad. Oh yeah, it's so cringy. Yeah. This book is beyond cringe. Uh, but I think the more interesting answer is the Pariah by Anthony Ryan. Interesting. I haven't, yeah, yeah, I haven't. I, I haven't read that. I've read Anthony's other works, but I haven't read that series. I, I read Blood Song and I liked it, and then I read whatever the second one is, Tower Lord, and mm. I did not enjoy that one. I think I DNF that one. But when the Pariah came out, it was. I feel like it was just mismarketed. I feel like if it had been marketed Mm. the correct way, I would have had my expectations in the right place. But it was marketed as a, like, grimdark Robin Hood, where you're seeing this guy Mm. who's, like, a thief on the road, and he's, like, attacking caravans and stealing their gold, and, like, maybe he gets mixed into, like, this bigger conspiracy. Kind of like uh, like, uh, Glenn Cook's, uh, like, The Black Company kind of thing yeah i thought it was going to be kind of like that Mm -hmm. and you get in in the first like maybe 15 10 to 15 percent of the book is like a robin hood thing and you're like oh this could be really cool and then it just takes a steep nosedive i made i made a review for this book and it's one of the best viewed videos on our channel because i just go on a rant for like 15 20 minutes he he ends up going to jail and the and the prison section wasn't even that bad but somehow it gets it goes complete 180 away from the whole robin hood thing like it does not go anywhere near that ever again from prison he kind of becomes like a knight for this religious faction and it just goes super 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 deep into that and I'm and that's not like what you the, want based on like what the initial yeah i'm like this is not of the book give you. this is not what i wanted at all so that's that's my big disappointing book that's my probably oh man, that's my a bummer. least favorite yeah <laughs> yeah because i haven't read that but anthony's a really great guy i just haven't read yeah, that book for sure yeah, yeah definitely damn man yeah <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I'm sorry to rush us out of here. I, uh, no worries, I'm seeing, man. We've I'm been chatting for almost two and a half hours. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did really want to talk about tattoos because I've just recently decided to get oh, a nice. tattoo. But I will I will save that. I'm, I want to have you on again for sure. You should have both like, MJ and I on together. Yes. MJ and I were thinking about doing something recently. Maybe we'll do something with both of you and bring yeah. you on and we'll finish up some of these topics. Because MJ I... and I are both into tattoos. She's, she's oh. getting new ones all the time. Oh, shit. Okay, let's do that. Because do you I not also know that wanted... MJ has tattoos? I didn't know that at all. No, no she's, got, she's got a bunch. Like on, She gets one for every new book that she releases, too. Oh, shit. Okay, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did know that she had a quill. I knew I knew that she had the quill, but yeah. I think that's yeah. the only one I knew about. Uh, but she did want to talk about one of the topics we have here that is fantasy still nerdy. So maybe we'll we'll save that for that discussion. Cool. You know, the three or four of us can can talk about it. But um, before we get out of here, is there anything coming up on SFF Addicts soon that you would like to promote or talk about or anything you're excited for? Yeah, man. Um, no, we got some awesome guests coming up. Uh, so we've got a uh, new episode coming out. Um, I mean, by the time this releases, they'll already be out, but like a really sure. cool masterclass with Veronica Roth. 
Uh, we've got two episodes with Stuart Turton, um, who wrote the Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle and The Devil in the Dark Water. Okay. Just like fucking hilarious, dude. Like super, super funny. Um, nice. In like a very British self deprecating way. Uh, and then we've got uh, two episodes coming out with Rebecca Roanhorse, and then another two coming out uh, soon with Christopher Buhlman, who's the author of uh, oh, Black yeah. Tongue Thief. So we're yeah, really, really yeah. excited to chat with him. Over. Yeah, right super good. I didn't, I didn't like the audiobook, but I, I he, bought, he narr- I bought he the He narrated physical. the audiobook in like a Scottish accent. It was just MJ too thick of an accent. I, just, I was just <laughs> like, I can't understand. It, it's not even that he was like a bad like narrator it was like it was was like it was like it was like too well done yeah (laughs) exactly it was too well done uh but i got the physical so i could read it that way yeah that's great man but yeah very excited to chat with them uh yeah and you can check out mushroom blues mushroom blues baby. yeah so now in hardcover paperback and ebook and then yeah look forward to the audiobook later this year which i'm very very excited about and i'll keep people updated you can always Check me out on social media, yeah, uh, Twitter, Instagram, all that uh, at Adrian M Gibson. If you want to keep updated on stuff, sounds great. Well, dude, thank you so much for hanging out with me for like thank you too, two dude. and a half hours, yeah, man. man. That was great. I <laughs> I legitimately had had a great time chatting me with too. you. I I had kind of known you from like seeing your podcasts and stuff, but I didn't. I had no idea what it was going to be like having a conversation right. with you. And I really just want to talk with you for another like three hours. <laughs> if I didn't have to go to this movie, I'd be like, let's push it a little bit. But <laughs> oh, man. yeah, no, I definitely I want that. to have you back so we can, we can chat some more, dude. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. I awesome. think with MJ too, it'd be a really great time. Oh, it's going to be such a fun conversation. And then I'll just rub it in your face that I stole her from you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, just hold that over me forever. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> sorry not Our, sorry but it's okay yeah right i know like how can you you know it's no she she like totally belongs over there she's a great she's a great co-host for you guys over there so yeah um all right well that is going to wrap us up guys normally this is the point where i tell you about our upcoming content but i'm not exactly sure when this episode will land amongst all the other things that we have coming out in the next few weeks but we are excited to get into stormlight here very soon this summer we'll be going into the way of kings uh and then also to continue our harry potter episode series that we've named potter watch The first two episodes of that are already out, so head to our playlist section on YouTube and look for that one if you'd like to uh, check out our thoughts on... uh, We have like a prequel episode to Potter Watch where we talk about Harry Potter in general, and then we've done the first book. And then I think next month we'll probably be doing Chamber of Secrets, so you can keep an eye out for that when it drops. Uh, Also, by the time this episode comes out, we've already done our late night live stream where we get drunk with our friend Sam after reading Fourth Wing, uh, and we will likely have torn that book to shreds. So (laughs) go check that out. It's going to be very funny. It's this whole concept that she came up with. Yes, exactly. She's like, (laughs) she's like, this is so not gonna be your guys' thing. She's like, I like this book but I think it would be super funny if we all just got really drunk and just tore it to shreds. And it's like, let's do it on a live stream. That'd be so much fun. (laughs) Um, So we're gonna be doing that on, uh, on the 18th, but this will have already come out by the time you see that so go back into the live playlist and and check that out because i'm sure it was hilarious lastly check the description down below here on youtube for all of adrian's links both for the podcast and his book and i got twitter down there Uh, i'll have all of those down there along with our own links for twitter and patreon and everything else you guys you guys know what the deal is you guys know you go to the description you find all the links that's what every booktuber does that's where all the stuff is uh but that's gonna do it for us today thank you so much for watching and until next time don't eat the glowing purple mushrooms unless you want really cool superpowers please please eat them (laughs) (laughs) thank you everybody (laughs) and a big shout out to caitlin thank you so much for backing us at the green bone tier 